On an autumn evening in Palmer, 2005, a woman we'll call Jane Doe was washing dishes after dinner. When her daughter asked to go outside and play, Minutes later, Jane heard a strange sound outside. She caught sight of a small, childlike figure darting through the trees. The figure suddenly raced away, faster than any child she had ever seen. Could it have been something else? Legends say that small, malevolent creatures haunt the Alaskan wilderness. Whatever it was, her daughter was nowhere to be found and has not been seen since. Inside the vast frontier of Alaska is a mysterious triangle where each year, five out of every thousand people go missing. Something out there. Three investigators look for answers. Jax, a former police officer. Ken, a specialist in strange phenomena. And Tommy, an expert on Alaskan legends. Together, they uncover mysterious sightings and ancient legends, exploring the possibilities of those who go Missing in Alaska. A lot of little places to hide in here, Ken. I see that. Pretty dense brush all through here. The team begins their investigation, exploring the woods behind the town of Palmer, where the young girl went missing. Her family has since moved away. Hey guys, can we stop for a second? I'm getting a little winded. Yeah. So I gotta ask, I know your wheels are spinning. What's your theory? So check it out. Other than the missing girl, all of the children of Palmer were accounted for at the time she vanished, right? Right. That's, true. That's what she said. So then who was this small childlike figure that the mother reported seeing? And all over the world, you have these enduring legends of these little elves, fairies, pixies. In Asia, you have the Nitaweo. In Africa, the Agagwe. Every continent has different types of little gnome-like creatures. Diminutive human-like beings are among the most fabled entities of all time. The more famous of these legends have become commonplace in modern culture. Leprechauns, which originated in Ireland. Elves, descended from Norse mythology. And the dwarves of Germanic folklore. Some are viewed as benevolent. Others as pranksters who hide gold or steal food. But the Alaskan versions are painted as much more sinister. I've heard stories you know, all my life from other tribes up north of here. The Yupik, they have the Ensign Rock, and all the parents tell the kids not to stay out after dark, that they'll try to t come and take your kids away. The archetype of the Alaskan gnome is a stout, powerful figure about three and a half feet tall, bearing vicious claws and teeth, with clothing made from animals and other natural materials. They are also said to be incredibly fast and have a nasty, aggressive disposition. So you have stories of little gnome-like uh, creatures here in Alaska? Yes, little, little, little people, they, they've called them, or, or gnome-like. In Alaskan lore, these stories of these small beings are terrifying and go back centuries. Different tribes give them different names, Urchinhawk, Jinxiaq, Aminarok, but they're all described the same, violent, malicious. They'll kidnap you or even kill you if you cross them. All right, guys, we need to get, moving? get to the top. Yeah, it's yeah. starting to get dark here. Ken always has interesting theories about missing person cases in the Alaska Triangle. But right now, I'm thinking either this is a natural predator, like a bear or a wolf, or even more likely, a human predator. As an investigator, my mind tends to go there in cases like these. 
I'm seeing all kinds of animal tracks right here. You got moose track here and a wolf, looks like a wolf track there. Very large canine. Definitely a, a sign that there are a lot of living things out here. After seeing signs of wolf out here, it makes me wonder if that's what the missing girl's mother saw. You know, when you're nervous and you have an active imagination, maybe you think you saw a small person when you actually just saw an animal. Hey guys, what's this? Hey, who's that? A rabbit's foot? That's a rabbit's foot. Something was chewing on it. Chewing on it all right the there. flesh off of that. Hey, look at that. It's like blood. I don't see any blood on the ground anywhere. Oh, there's no tracks around here. The leaf litter is too thick. Finding blood in the forest is not that unusual. Animals make kills out here all the time. But we're investigating a missing person case, so it's important that we examine every piece of evidence that we find. I think we need to take some of this blood and have Figure it Figure out what it is. It's a good idea to make sure this isn't human blood on this tree. I don't think it is, but the lab will answer that question for sure. As Jax takes the blood sample in for analysis, Ken and Tommy decide to investigate the gnome theory further. They meet with a local native named Jerry, who's an expert on Alaskan legends of little people. So we're investigating uh, a disappearance. A small girl disappeared. And um, what's really strange is that the mother claims that she saw this little figure, like a little person maybe, right around the time that her daughter vanished. There's been many, many stories of the little people. They're Ichjinghaks or Jinxiaks. They're powerful little people. Do you think that these little people could somehow be connected to the disappearance of this little girl? Very possible. There's many stories of children not coming back. Supposing we wanted to go find these little people. Up in mountains, they live in caves. You will find little things that they leave behind, bones. Bones? Animal parts. Mm. There's stories of them stealing caribou meat. They leave no tracks. Jerry's description of the gnomes makes them seem very primitive, almost caveman-like. And it supports the idea that whatever they are, they could be very uncivilized, almost dangerous. With the information from Jerry to ponder, Ken goes to meet with Jax, who has results from the blood sample analysis. What do we got? So, here's our sample, all right? Yeah. We have tested against five other things. First thing I wanted to have them roll out was human blood. Sure. All right? Bears, because they roamed the area. Moose, we obviously saw some signs. Saw of some droppings, yeah, yeah. And then a rabbit. We did find that rabbit. And the last, and this is what it came positive for, is caribou. Finding caribou blood several feet up on a tree is highly unusual. A likely explanation is that a hunter bagged a caribou, passed the tree, and wiped some blood off or something. But we didn't see drag marks, and I can't help but think of the folklore we heard from Jerry. Well, check this out. This is really crazy, because Jerry was just telling us that the Alaskan gnomes, the Jinxiok, that's what he was primarily calling them, supposedly don't leave any tracks, and their primary food source, that's the caribou. Suppose one of these beings, because they're super strong, super fast, was actually carrying a dead caribou and smashed the carcass up against a tree, and that was the result of the blood left dripping down the tree. I don't know, man. I know. You know I always hear you out, but you know I always have a hard time with some of these things, you know? I mean, I need to see a lot more evidence than what we got right now. We've seen some pretty crazy things here in Alaska. But to jump to a gnome theory based on some blood on a tree is quite a stretch. I still think the girl could have been snatched by a human predator. And if not that, then a bear is the next obvious guess. I think that what we need to do is set up a, a trap, put caribou meat in an area near where we found the blood splatter on the tree, and use a GPS tracking device. We can monitor from our phone. After tracking down some caribou meat from a local hunter, the team heads out to plant it as bait in hopes of identifying whatever is eating caribou in the mountains behind Palmer. Got all our gear? I got the cameras. I've got the meat. 
infrareds in my back. Let's go. All right, cool, lead on. We've got to hike up the mountain again behind Palmer, this time in the dark, to the spot where we found the caribou blood. <sighs> Feel the burn, Ken. Is this it, Tommy? Yeah, I think over here is where we're at. Does it look familiar? Yeah, yeah, right here. We probably want to set the camera uphill facing down. That yeah. way we have a wider coverage. Exactly. Area. Good idea. Figure out where you want to put the uh, caribou meat. Right. We're going to attach a thermal imaging camera to a tree facing the caribou meat. So if anything or anyone touches the meat, we'll get video. And looks good. Big chunk of meat. Yeah, I'm going to cut it right through here, and we're going to insert the tracker there, OK? All righty. With the GPS tracker in place, We'll get a message on our smartphone if there's any movement of the caribou meat, which means we can leave the area. Hopefully with us gone, that'll encourage something to take it. Maybe a little wider. All right, looks like it's running. We've got a good signal. Next step here is if it moves, it, it'll alert us. Good deal. You know, guys, I got to tell you, there's actually some scientific basis to believe that these gnomes, if that's what we're going to call them, are actual flesh and blood creatures, and I'll tell you why. 2003 on the island of Flores, which is in Indonesia, they discovered bones of a very small hominid, Homo floresiensis. Standing a mere three and a half feet tall, Homo floresiensis lived alongside modern humans until 12,000 years ago. Despite their small brain, they are believed to have built boats and used stone tools as well as being incredibly successful hunters. Who's to say that they might not have migrated across from Asia into North America when the land bridge still existed, right? So, I mean, we could essentially be talking about an archaic, basal, relic, hominid form remaining undetected somewhere here in the wilderness of Alaska. It is possible. Yeah. All right. Who's that? Who's that? Did you guys hear that? I don't know, guys. That could have just been a dying animal. I think it was a snowshoe hare. Snowshoe hares are common in Alaska and are known for their sharp, shrill cry. What direction did it come from, guys? Guys, it's over here. Let me get the thermal image out. This way, yeah. I pull out my smartphone, which has a special thermal adapter. It will show any residual heat signatures in the darkness. This direction, huh, Ken? Yeah, it was right over here. Hold on, guys. Picking something up over here. Guys, get, get over here. Oh, what is that? That's weird, man. Oh, man. What the heck is that? Our thermal imager picks up a couple of war marks on a log. Heat dissipates quickly, so whatever left those marks must have been right by us. Something warm had stepped there, huh? It's like something was just standing right there. There's something moving around out here. Obviously, we don't know what that something is. These marks could have been left here by anything. Maybe a wolf caught a rabbit here, and that could explain the noises that we heard, too. Well, I'm pretty sure that sound was a hare. They're pretty common here. I think we need to get moving, let our bait have a chance to work and do its thing here. I agree. Us tramping around the woods is just going to ward something off. Yeah. What do you think, Ken? I think I'm getting pretty creeped out right now. Let's go. By the next morning, with no sign of movement from the GPS tracker, the team decides to continue their investigation by seeking out new witnesses who have stories of gnomes in the area. Jax meets with a local security officer, Dean Spradlin. He claims to have had a highly unusual experience just a few years ago. We're out here in, in Alaska. We're kind of exploring the Alaskan Triangle areas and anomalies. Uh, what is exactly the case you're investigating? The girl who turned up missing 10 years ago? Exactly. That's why we're here. OK, so you're familiar with that story. Very familiar with it. So I'm assuming why it's still on people's minds. Yeah, and that girl's still missing. So it's still, still an open, open, cold case right now? Yeah, we still don't know what happened to her. It sounds so strange, but 
A lot of our information has led us to this area because we're looking for a possibility of creatures that are, are like gnomes. Gnomes could be behind it. Really? Actually, gnomes aren't that unusual to hear about in this town. Well, Halloween, you know, most towns, the kids go trick-or-treating until late into the evening. Here, they, they shut down by 8 o'clock at the latest. I found that out the hard way my first uh, Halloween here several years ago. Really? Yeah, I was actually out at about 8.30, thinking that I was going to be looking for rowdy teenagers. And I received a call about checking out a strange disturbance in a nearby residential area. So I'm walking to where the report was, was given. And the only light is what's coming from my flashlight. And all of a sudden, a rock crashes behind me. Well, I turn around to see, you know, what was that? And, uh, and a little person throws another rock the same size. It was a rock that I could barely pick up, let alone throw it. So you saw? What threw it at you? It looked like a little man. It's like a man-child. But the build, the demeanor, the face of, of a man. But like, like I said, I only got a glimpse. But you saw enough of it to think that it was a possibility that it was a gnome. I can't deny the possibility of it. Uh, everywhere else, it sounds like folklore, superstition. But I do know what I saw. A child could not have thrown rocks the size that he's describing. So I'd say this is an unusual story. But we still need to find hard evidence that these gnomes exist. What, what, where would these gnomes live? Well, some people think they live underground. We have over 600,000 square miles of wilderness in Alaska. We have lots of places where nobody's ever been. We have a lot of unexplored territory. Who knows what's out there? Is there caves in this area? Well, it's not caves like you would think of caves, but there's ice caves. You think you'd point them out to, on a map for me? Yeah, if you got a map. Have I'd you been right there? Yeah, I've been there. Okay, so it's on a glacier? Yeah. So we're See, here. We're here right there. Oh, the, the Matanuska Glacier? Yes. I definitely think that we need to investigate these caves for any signs of these so-called gnomes. Really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, you're welcome. And be safe out there. Okay, take care of yourself. As Jax finishes his meeting with Officer Spradlin, Ken and Tommy seek out another local who claims to have experience with these mysterious gnomes. Hi, I'm Ken. Hi, Ken. Sarah here. Sarah volunteers her time working with kids at a local community center. According to her, all the children are afraid that gnomes are lurking in the area. Sarah, this is such a cool little playground, and yet there's no kids here. Why is that? Uh, it's, well, it's starting to get late at night, and these little Iminarks, they came out late at night. I'm scared of them myself. Mm -hmm. I know I've heard about um, children being abducted, and um, some kids ran to me. Um, they said there, there was something chasing them from the woods. Do uh, you think they were being chased by the Imanarok? It's a possibility that there's an Imanarok around the neighborhood, and, you know, these are dangerous creatures. I've always heard that these Imanaroks are very strong and powerful. Clearly, there's something in this area that's being witnessed from time to time, and I'm hoping that we'll get a good look at it from our thermal camera up on the mountain. All right, thank awesome. you. Sure. Be safe. It's getting dark, man. Yeah. Let's get out of here. Check this out. Our tracker is, is... What? No way. It's moved. The tracker in our caribou meter is on the move, which means something has taken it. We've got to grab Jax, get on it, and follow it right away. OK. Why do so many people go missing in Alaska? Is it purely because of the rugged landscape and aggressive predators? Or are there other reasons lurking in this vast terrain? A mother sees a small, unknown being just before her daughter goes missing. Could native stories of vicious gnomes be more truth than legend? The team has just sprung a trap that could answer that question. You got everything, guys? I've got the GPS here. Yeah, have we got any other notifications? Well, it's still working, but it is not moving. It's just stationary. We just have the final location. Last, yeah. Last transmitted. Right. The best part about using a GPS tracker in our bait is we have a last known location transmitted to us. We need to get to that spot quick, because whatever took our bait could still be in the area. We 
We still got a ways, but we're on the right path. The first thing that we want to do is check the original location where we left the bait and see if there's any clues there. Maybe we can determine what moved the GPS before we track it down. There's a camera right there. Camera looks good. So it's meat's right there. Oh, it's gone. You see any tracks? Nothing. All right, well, we got a fan out right here. All right. You can, ain't they? Nothing. What about you? No, just brush. You guys got anything? No. No. I'm going to take the trail cam back to the truck, see if we got anything on here. I had to have caught something. Since we don't have any clues from the scene of what we're dealing with here, it's important to get eyes on the footage right away. Even if this is just an animal, we need to know what kind of animal for safety's sake. You got your bear spray, Tommy? I do, in the pack. We got about a quarter mile to go, so you and I got to hoof it. I think he can meet us back down at the truck. Something to be eating that meat out there, so you got to be careful. Give us a shout as soon as you get there, OK? I will. OK. This is the second time we found signs of something in the forest without finding any tracks nearby. Back when we found the blood on the tree, there were lots of leaves on the ground, so that could have prevented tracks. And here, the ground is hard enough that maybe something could have passed through here without leaving any marks. But Jerry also talked about how Alaskan gnomes don't leave tracks. The natives who established this lore centuries ago were expert trackers, so you have to give that detail some credibility. Is there an animal that walks lightly enough to avoid leaving tracks, or does this gnome legend have some truth to it? Hopefully, the video will tell us. That's just weird. What is that? This is the closest we're going to get. It's going to be within 10, 15 feet of here. You got the big spotlight. Yeah, so. yeah, I got it. I'll scan this brush. Oh, man, look at this. It's a mess, man. This might take us a while. I'm not seeing anything. Don't give up yet. It's got to be over here. <sighs> Ken, it's down there. That's it. You pull it out? Yeah, I got it. All right, cool. We hop down. Let's see that. I mean, we've got some massive scratches. Where's the meat? It was right there. There's no meat. Hey, guys, are you up there? Yeah, I got you, man. What's going on? Hey, you guys aren't going to believe this. We got something on the trail cam. You guys need to come down and check it out. All right, we're on our way. What you got for us, buddy? And check this out. See that? Hey. Wait, 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 rewind it. Back it, back it up. Holy oh, what is that? Something small. You can't tell what it is, though. This shape on the screen is hard to make out. Look at that. That's hauling ass. What do you think, Ken? Um, actually, that kind of appears humanoid. There's no doubt that whatever that is, it took our bait. The figure in this footage is hard to pin down. I can see how it might be a small person hunched over. But it could be a fox or a wolf. It's just not clear. Well, guys, what do we do now? I've been thinking about this. So here's our map, guys. Right? The green marker is where we left the GPS. The yellow one is where we found it. And the red marker is the ice caves. Look over right there. Look what that is. It's an exact straight line. Whoever took that meat was heading towards those caves. So are you saying we need to head out there? We need to go to those caves. Let's do it. All right, guys, let's pack it up and let's get the ice caves in the morning. Obviously, the ice caves are where this investigation has to go next. And it could be right into the den of the vicious Jinxioc.
Alaska is known for the biggest animals on the continent. But could the most dangerous creature here be a small one? Horrifying tales of aggressive, violent gnomes permeate native legends. And local resident Natalie Vega believes she had a close encounter with one. Our dog ran away, and the next morning, our neighbor called us and said that they saw our dog a few miles away in some remote area. And I called my friend Allie and asked her if she could look for the dog with me. We get to the area, and we get out. And Allie saw blood on the ground. And then we start calling for our dog. And as we're calling, we get hit with a bunch of snow. And we turn around, and I saw something move. It was small, maybe three feet tall. And it had the face of an old man covered in moss and sticks and dirt. It was just horrid. All of a sudden, it just moved so fast. We couldn't believe it. We were so scared, we ran to the car and just drove off. We never saw the dog again. After tracking their stolen bay toward the Matanuska Glacier, the team heads out to search for ice caves. And if they find them, to see if anything might be living inside them. Ice caves. It would be a great dwelling for something that doesn't want to be found. We have a little stop up here where the guy's been gracious enough to loan us his snow machine so we can get out to the glacier. Well, looks like here we go, and I think, uh, yeah, there's our machines. It is unsafe for large vehicles to traverse a glacier because of the shifting nature of its surface. The team will have to use snowmobiles to approach the ice caves. But the machines will only take them to a point where the terrain becomes too rough. Then they will have to hike the rest of the way to the caves. Matanuska Glacier is the largest accessible glacier in Alaska. At four miles wide and 26 miles long, it has been carving its way through a valley for the last 10,000 years, moving at a rate of one foot per day. Six people are known to have died here, with dozens of others reported missing. Is that because of the ever-shifting and unpredictable landscape, or something more sinister? Guys, definitely think with all this ice, we need our crampons today. Hey guys, we got to be careful out here, you know, with this warm weather, the sun beating down. We got to watch our step, make sure we don't step in any crevasses. How deep are we talking? Some have been known to swallow up airplanes. Really? Let's head off that way, up that first mound there. Let's do it. A lot of this glacier is uncharted because it changes constantly. Ooh. But some local guides said the kind of caves that we're looking for were recently seen due north of here. Walking on glacier ice, especially glacier ice covered in snow, is very dangerous. It's important to take it very slow and with each step to make sure there's not a crevasse underneath you. Oh, what do we got up there, Ken? You guys seeing this? Wow, look, look at that. that. Oh. It's got to be what the cops said. Check it out. After trekking across the glacier, we finally see our very first ice cave. This is extremely exciting. It's what we've been waiting for. We've been searching for evidence of these proto-pygmies. Wow. And this would make a perfect habitat for some small and rarely seen creature. Literally a cave of ice, smooth as glass. Pretty incredible. These caves are awe-inspiring, but also dangerous. A lot are formed by meltwater runoff, which erodes them and makes them weak, and they are known to collapse suddenly. So we have to be on guard. 
You know, guys, it goes without saying, if we're looking for a small hominid, which is what I think we're looking for here, a cave makes perfect sense. They're excellent defensive fortifications because they only have like one entrance. You can stockpile weapons or food or whatever. Don't leave any stone unturned. Look into every little small opening, hole, cut, whatever. We'll do it. Let's go. I've done a lot of research in caves, but I've never been in a glacier cave. I mean, here you have a structure that's constructed of frozen water. It's rather mesmerizing. But I can't lose sight of the fact that I'm in an extremely volatile and dangerous situation. I could slip and fall on my head. I could step into a crevasse and disappear, never to be seen again. Tommy, I want to take this a little slow. It's as warm as it's been today. I don't, I don't feel like taking a bath right now. Well, that's plain feels, smart. Feels pretty solid, buddy. Look at these walls, Tommy. Look how far you can see inside of them. Yeah. Guys, this thing goes in pretty deep here. Oh, that was indentation right here. It's natural little code. <clears throat> Watch your step. Look at this, Tommy. Hey, Ken! Ken, check it out. Ken, yeah, check this out. I'm over here. That does not belong here. All right, I'm coming, guys. Hold on. Where are you? Come back here. It's low. Watch your head. It's slippery, too. Watch your step. This way. Ken, yeah, check this out. Crap. Look at this, Tommy. Hey, Ken! Ken, check it out. Ken, yeah, check this out. I'm over here. That does not belong here. Ken, yeah, check this out. Crap. Got a caribou rack here. De definitely not a normal place to find something like this. As far as I know, Tommy, caribou don't go to die in places like this. No, nah, they're on tundra, usually flat land. No, but it is common for a predator to basically drag yeah, something you know, into a cave. Yes. But look around, there's no tracks. I mean, we've got glacier silt. We have some sort of paw print, hoof print, right? Bottom line is, this does not belong here. Want to move this backside? Yeah, we got a lot of ground to cover. Let's keep going. The team continues their trek to find deeper caves in the area. If the gnomes of Alaskan legend are real, it's believed they live in groups and sometimes keep their kidnapping victims in their underground lairs with them, requiring a larger space. Look up ahead, Ken. Wow. Look like a bigger cave. This is what we're looking for, guys. We find a second cave that appears to go much deeper into the ice and potentially offer a lot more shelter. This could be the perfect place for something to move in, set up camp, and stay hidden. Be careful, guys. Look how, look how much this thing's melting. It's melting. Look at right. all that water running down there. What's the plan here? All right. Well, what do you think about Ken and I going down and you monitoring us from here? Good idea. The team decides the safest approach is to have Tommy remain outside as backup in case there are any dangerous shifts in the ice. Jax and Ken will be equipped with wireless cameras, which Tommy can use to follow their progress. Let's go. All right, be safe. It gets pretty tiny in here, Ken. This thing is endless. Thanks, so Seven. I know this is going to be tight, but I think I'm going to go that way. Maybe this will open up when I pop through this crap. I mean, I trust you, man, if you think you can make it. That looks like a pretty tight squeeze. Are you sure? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Keep on comms. You got your walkie, right? Yeah, I got my walkie. All right. All right, be careful. 
Because these gnomes are supposed to be quite small, I decided to investigate a crawl space. It's a bit claustrophobic for me. Before a gnome, it would have plenty of room. I just have to keep my cool and keep pressing forward. Tommy, it's Jax, can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. Ken and I have split up. Can you see my feed? Yeah, I got you here on the screen. OK, still a good signal? Good signal. All right, I'm pressing forward. Careful down there. I also want to be careful not to get out of communication range. If I get in trouble, Tommy's my only link to the outside world. Tommy, come in. Over. Can you hear me? Over. I can hear you, Ken. Yes. I'm going to go down this corridor. You copy? Uh, be safe there, man. Yeah, will do. Uh, this looks pretty amazing. Our greatest concern while investigating this cave is shifting ice. Because the glacier is constantly moving, a shift nearby could create a chain reaction, resulting in a collapse of the cave. All kinds of little nooks and crannies. And it looks worn down. It looks like something's been moving through here. You see what I'm seeing? What is that? I don't know yet. I gotta get closer. Yeah, it's amazingly bright in here. Really, really bright. Wow. Oh. Tommy, you seeing this? It's another antler like we found in the other cave. Just one rack. That's as far as I can go. You better come on out then. All right, I'm going to bring the handler with me, so it'll take me a second. Tommy, did you hear that? Over. Tommy, I'm hearing something. Do you hear that? Over. Hey, Jax, I'm not hearing anything from Ken. Can you, can you see him or hear him? Tommy, I got nothing. I can't see him. I don't know where he's at. Move. Ken, can you hear me? Jack, why don't you come on out here? I'm not sure where Ken's at. We need regroup here. All right, I'm coming out. Somewhere inside the ice caves, Ken and the cameraman following him are no longer in communication with the others. The team doesn't know if they're lost or hurt. Ken, Ken, are you there? Check this thing out. Another caribou rack, man. Wow. What's going on with Ken? Nothing. I'm not hearing anything. Ken, is Jax. Do you read? Jax, Tommy, do you copy? Over. Hey, guys. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm completely turned around in this cave, and I'm hearing cracking ice. I'm trying to find my way out of here. Over. Ken, it's Jax. Do you read? It's getting warmer. You think, uh, I mean, shoot, I don't want to. I mean, this thing looked pretty stable where I was, but you know, he could have gone down somewhere smaller where the ice is melting. Man, I'm getting worried. Yeah. Did you hear that? I think I hear him. Ken, where are you? Ken! Yeah! Tommy! Hurry up! All right, I'm coming. Ken! 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 Jack! Tommy, I hear him! Ken! How are you? Ah. Ah. need help? Ah. Come on, bud. Ah. Come on. Oh my God. Oh, you get it? I got totally lost. You all right? I thought the ice was going to cave down right onto my head. I couldn't reach you guys. Yeah. Ken's experience in the caves is closely related to the gnome legends in Alaska. Look. It's said that they can disorient you and lead you into danger, and they'll do it just for fun. 
Obviously, Ken could have just taken a wrong turn or something, but it does make you think. So we yeah. say we get out of here for the day. Yeah, the sun's going down. It's going to be dark here soon. All right. So glad to see you guys. I bet. We were very, very worried, man. With the mystery of the missing girl still not solved, the team heads back into town to consider everything they've found during their investigation. Okay, guys, so what do we got? Let's review the evidence. We have the blood on the tree, and then we have the small figure that we got on the trail cam. It was just a small image of something moving. It was something. It was a blur, but it was small and it was fast. Yep. And we also heard that noise out there. Remember, that was kind of like a weird, high-pitched whinny. Tommy thought it was a snowshoe here. Well, earlier today, I was reviewing the footage from the ice cave, and right before the ice started cracking, there was an odd sound. But I didn't notice it at the time. There was almost like an undertone to that sound. OK, here we go. This is the recording. Play that back. Turn the volume up right here. You hear that? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Weird. That sounds a lot like the noise we heard in the forest the other night. There was nothing out there but us, OK? It was the ice and us. Right. Gnomes are known to be tricksters and mischievous. Perhaps they've been toying with us this whole time, leaving clues that are big enough to hint at their existence, but too small to prove anything. Maybe by going in that ice cave, we were essentially invading their domain. Too strange, guys. Yeah, it was odd. For now, the team is unable to tie the young girl's disappearance to the fabled gnomes of Alaska. But history proves that small humanoid beings have existed and even thrived on our planet. Could Alaska be their new breeding ground? In these rugged wilds, a creature lacking in size would have to compensate through cunning. What's that? or viciousness. And if native legends are true, such violent creatures could be one of the reasons people go missing in Alaska. night in 2011, three hunters were heading out to their favorite overnight hunting spot along the northern edge of Denali Park in Alaska. They never imagined something might be hunting them. They stopped to relax for a bit and indulge in a quick smoke and a drink. As they talked, Ben Jones decided he needed a pit stop. He trudged off among the trees, looking for a little privacy. But as he walked, he continued farther into the woods than his friends Mark and Tom expected. Something apparently drew his attention. Moments later, they heard the sound. They hurried to respond, but they couldn't find Ben anywhere. Instead, they saw a monstrous beast among the trees that sent them running. Local legends of a bear-wolf hybrid called the Amarok, or demon wolf, pervade the area. Could this creature have targeted this hunting party for its own vicious harvest? The only thing known for sure, Ben Jones hasn't been seen since. 
Inside the vast frontier of Alaska is a mysterious triangle where each year, five out of every thousand people go missing. Something out there. Three investigators look for answers. Jax, a former police officer. Ken, a specialist in strange phenomena. And Tommy, an expert on Alaskan legends. Together, they uncover mysterious sightings and ancient legends, exploring the possibilities of those who go missing in Alaska. Pretty rugged environment out here. Yeah, it is. Ken and Jax arrive at the area of Denali Park where Ben Jones went missing. They're meeting with Ben's friend Mark, who was with him that night. Hey, I'm Ken. Hey, Ken. Mark. Nice to meet you. How are you doing, Jax? Hey, nice Jax. Good to meet you. Mark is going to take us to the exact spot where his buddy Ben disappeared and tell us what he thinks he saw that night. Right here. So this is where you began your hunt that day? This is where we started, yeah. The caribou here are pretty plentiful and active. We started with, you know, a couple of beers, try to warm up. It was getting kind of cold. Did you just have the beers before you got out here or when you were out here? No, we always bring them with us, you know. As an investigator, I'm always trying to evaluate the validity of an eyewitness. When I hear that alcohol was involved, I know that it might have altered Mark's perceptions. We'd like to map it out where you last saw Ben and retrace your steps, step by step, the best as you can recollect. Yeah, that sounds great. I'm happy to help. This is a spot we like to kind of survey the area from. Call it the V. It's perfect. We can get a nice vantage point by climbing up here and staking out the area. The thing I noticed about this location is beyond the vantage point, the terrain is pretty flat. I had wondered if Ben had slipped down a hillside or fallen into a ravine. But that doesn't seem to be a possibility here. And we sat here, took a break, polished off our flasks, and then Ben took off. We started getting worried about him, right? Because we didn't hear from him or see him for a while. This is when we heard the noise, the howl. Howling is unique to wolves. Bears and other large predators don't exhibit this behavior. But wolf howls tend to be a rallying of the pack. For a lone animal to make this sound, it's most likely a warning to an intruder. Do you remember what direction you heard that vocalization yeah. from? Well, it sounded like it came from over there. So we started trying to find Ben, and as we were looking around, I saw something. It was like a bear, but different. Can you take us to the area where you saw this creature? We're getting close. Just up this way. OK, you were standing here? I was standing right here. And the animal was? Right there. Bump. Okay. Yeah, it's about 100 yards. It was like the biggest bear I'd ever seen. It looked like a brown bear, but it had some weird differences to it. This like gray, kind of nasty, natted fur. Mark definitely feels that like he saw some sort of strange creature out here. But as far away as he was, and as dark as it was, and the fact that he'd been drinking, I'm thinking this could have been a normal animal attack. You've seen bears out here. How much do you think this weighed? Easily 900 pounds. I mean, this thing was huge. It was almost like if you took a bear and added a wolf nose or snout to it. That's what it was. Interesting. Mark describes this creature as sort of a wolf-bear hybrid, which fits a known legend from this area, the Amarok. The Amarok, AKA the demon wolf, has been a fixture of Inuit mythology for hundreds of years, sporting the face of a wolf and the body of a bear, and standing up to nine feet tall. The Amarok is reported to target lone hunters at night. But Ben was not fully alone. Could the demon wolf be the animal that got him? And could it be far more aggressive than previously thought? Even though I'm skeptical, there is a mystery here. Where did Ben go? If this was just a wolf or bear, how did he disappear so quickly? And why wasn't anything found? This case definitely requires more research and investigation. You ready to head back? Yeah, yeah let's go. Can you uh, take us out of here, Mark? Yeah, sure. OK. Images of massive wolf-like predators are not limited to Alaskan lore. 
In Norse mythology, wolves represent the force that will bring down the cosmos, including the devouring of our sun and moon. Even in modern children's stories, the big bad wolf has come to represent evil incarnate. This evil became all too real in France in the 1760s, when an oversized wolf known as the Beast of Gévaudan killed and ate dozens of people. But the Alaskan legend suggests a beast that's even more terrifying, a wolf with the size and aggressiveness of a bear. Jax and Tommy visit a local expert named Aussie to learn more about the demon wolf legend. Hey. Good evening, my friend, Aussie. Hey, you too, man. This is Jax. Hey, nice hey Jax, you. nice to meet you. What brings you to this part of this world? We understand that you can maybe tell us a little bit more about this Amorak. Amorak? Yes. OK. I've heard a couple stories here and there for people from up north known as the Inupiaq people. This one story is about this father who was mourning the death of one of his children. Apparently, they suspect that this child was eaten by the wolf or the Amawak. That mourner went out there searching for answers, and Amawak just killed him, you know, right there on the spot. This Amawak is mean. It can come out of nowhere without you knowing. They usually follow their prey, which is the caribou or the moose. If they're aggressive, They'll follow you, they'll hunt you down. You have to stay on top of them and show them that you're the master, you're not afraid. If we come across one, is there a way to defend ourselves? Good luck. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Awesome. Come again. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. According to Brittany Walters, good luck is the only reason she wasn't a victim of the demon wolf herself. I was walking my dog along the edge of the woods. I looked on the ground and I saw animal remains. I couldn't tell what it was because whatever had gotten to it really destroyed this animal. And in the past, I'm able to identify the animal because the, the carcass is somewhat intact. I thought this was really strange, so I decided to head home immediately. As I turned around, I heard a howl. And I looked back, and there was this huge animal. I thought it was a wolf at first, because it had a canine face and legs like a wolf. I was so scared. And then it got back down on its four feet and ran in the opposite direction. I've never seen an animal run that fast before. Based on Mark's testimony that Ben was attacked at night, the team heads back to the area where Ben went missing for an overnight stakeout. They hope to see what is stirring here and whether any animal they find might tie into Ozzy's depiction of the Amarok. We don't know if the Amarok is real or just a scary story, but legends of wolf-like monsters are known throughout North America. In Canadian lore, an animal similar to the demon wolf is called the Wahila. In Michigan, in the late 1800s, a similar creature was dubbed the Michigan Dogman. The team has to wonder if there could be any truth behind all these different sightings. See another attraction? Well, this is a good sign. We got something living up here. Hey, guys, these tracks come back over this way. We may have found a food source. Yeah, these are definitely moose tracks, food source for the wolves out here. The fact that we found these moose tracks indicates that there's a viable food source moving through the area. So it's reasonable to assume that there are going to be predators in this area as well. And it would be great to capture their movements on the cameras that we brought with us. What do you think about here? This feels like kind of a good natural cut for a predator to kind of slink along low. Definitely, he would have cover. Yeah, we can put himself. the equipment up before it gets too much darker. Yeah, I think so, too. Let me see if I can find a spot down here, maybe a little lower. This little low cut, this is perfect. The team has infrared trail cameras that can record up to six hours of HD video. They'll aim them toward what they think is the most heavily trafficked path through this area. Ah, good location here, yeah. I think we have a good angle. Yeah. Anything that's alive that moves through here, we'll get it on film.
The team finds a good spot to settle in for the night, far enough from the cameras to not spook any wildlife, but close enough to hear anything that passes through. Back in prehistoric times, there were actually animals that would match the description of the Amarok quite well, one of course being the dire wolf. They were about 25% larger than modern wolves, and they were kind of built differently too. They had bigger, sturdier bodies, shorter legs, but they had these massive bone-crushing teeth. The dire wolf was the largest canine of all time, tipping the scales at 200 pounds and stretching more than five feet in length. It roamed North America until 10,000 years ago. This vicious predator was a fearsome hunter, competing toe-to-toe -to -toe with the saber-toothed tiger for territory. Some believe these creatures might not have died out, and given enough space, they could have evolved into something even bigger. Alaska is such a vast open land. Most of it's uninhabited by man, so there are plenty of places out there that something like this could be hiding. I'm not even kidding, did you hear out that? To the left. In the Alaska Triangle, a hunter has gone missing. Witnesses report seeing a massive beast, part wolf, part bear, that may be to blame. But is this animal simply a myth? Hybrid beings are a staple of ancient lore. Centaurs depict a cross between man and horse. Griffins are a blend of lion and eagle. But a pattern of recent modern sightings suggests the demon wolf could be real and the team's overnight stakeout might provide proof. I'm not even kidding, but do you out hear that? to the left. That came from down by the trail cams. Let's go check this out. Turn your light straight ahead. Is it over there? Let's turn it off and listen for a sight. I don't hear anything now. Well, we should finish out the night and see if we hear anything else. I agree. Let's go. The team returns to their stakeout, hoping for another chance at a sighting. But the rest of the night remains quiet. Here we are, gentlemen. The next morning, they arrive back at their cabin, anxious to see what their cameras recorded. It doesn't take long to find an answer. Hey, guys, come over and check this out. We got a little movement on the second camera. Did you see that? It's very quick. Watch it on the right side of the corner. It comes out in the last two seconds. Very fast and it's very low to the ground. It looks canine-like a little bit. It's obviously way too small to yeah. uh, Not enter into our Amarok. Yeah. The figure in the footage indicates the presence of real, normal-sized predators not an enormous monster. The team has to consider if recent sightings were of an ordinary wolf wow. that became exaggerated in the minds of frightened witnesses. I think we definitely should talk to some experts. You have some contacts at the zoo, right, Ken? Yeah, I've been talking to some uh, people over at the zoo. They're wolf experts, which, you know, to me is an obvious launch point for this investigation. If there's a chance that it's just a normal wolf out there, then our best approach is going to be to study wolf behavior to see if it fits the evidence in a way that would explain the eyewitness reports. As Jax puts his investigative skills to use, finding and researching additional eyewitness accounts, Ken pursues the theory that the animal they're after might be an ordinary wolf. He meets with Stephanie and Shannon, two experts on wolf behavior at the local zoo. Hello, ladies. Hi. 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 Whether we're dealing with an Amarok, a dire wolf, or just an ordinary gray wolf, we need to know more about Alaskan wolves and their behavior patterns in order to draw any conclusions about what's out there. I'm investigating, believe it or not, accounts of this monstrous demon wolf known as the Amarok. And I thought it might be helpful to come out and talk to you and perhaps get some knowledge and look at these fabulous animals since uh, this may be our culprit we don't know. Sounds good. What about their, you know, predation pattern? What do they eat? Uh, how do they hunt? Well, they eat moose and caribou, yeah. and some of them um, choose rabbits. 
um, whatever else they can get a hold of. What don't they eat if they're yeah. working yeah. as a pack, taking down large prey, or working individually for a little snack in between the big meals? I understand that they're very social animals. How unusual is it for you know a so-called lone wolf, an individual, to kind of strike off on its own? Obviously, all the males can't live in the group forever, and they have to distribute. But they like to be together. So even if there was a lone wolf, I think it would be looking for a group. I don't yeah. think they really thrive on being alone. Right. We just put some enrichment out for the wolves so you can see their predatory behavior. Here they come. Oh, it's so exciting. I love it. Wow. That's D. We, we let him out in order of dominance. Uh -huh. So since D's the alpha male, he's, he gets he's first the shot. first one out. Yeah. This is one of their very favorite things. It is interesting, though. You can see a lot of good pack behavior. Obviously, the two alphas are on the beaver right now. And yeah, see that? No one else is really coming around. They're observing. They're waiting their turn. Yeah. Everything about wolf behavior appears tied to this pack mentality they possess. They crave social interaction and rely on a social hierarchy in order to survive. So if this creature is acting alone, maybe it's not a typical wolf after all. Wolf attacks on humans. Is that something that's common? Is it very exceptional and unexpected? It's not very common. Wolves are really naturally shy and timid animals, even the ones here that have been habituated to people and sounds and movements. They're still really cautious about things that they're not sure of. The more I learn here, the more I think that this is not an ordinary wolf. But there is another possibility. This could be an extraordinary wolf. Based on its reported size, perhaps this is a wolf displaying gigantism. Gigantism is a condition that affects creatures throughout the animal kingdom. In humans, it's caused by an overproduction of growth hormone through a compromised pituitary gland or a mutated gene. Genetics are also behind the huge size of the liger, the offspring of a male lion and female tiger, which can top a thousand pounds. But the right environment can also spawn huge creatures, like the goliath frog, which benefits from relative isolation and limited predators. And the existence of deep sea gigantism suggests that cold temperatures at the bottom of the ocean can spawn oversized animals like the Japanese spider crab. Alaska features both isolation and cold temperatures. Could these conditions have created a gigantic wolf? And if so, might it be an outcast from its pack and have to adapt with increased aggression. Well, ladies, this information has been incredibly helpful. I can't thank you enough really? for meeting me out here, introducing me to your beautiful wolves. This has been really an amazing experience for me. Wanting to see if the gigantism theory matches current sightings, Ken joins Jax to interview a witness named Nick who claims to have had a demon wolf encounter just a couple of weeks ago. Nick agrees to meet with the team at the roadside location where this possible giant wolf appeared. How you doing? Good, Nick, right? Yes, sir, I'm Jax. Jax tells me that you saw something remarkable out here. What had happened was about 30 yards up that way past the junction there. It's about 2 a.m., pretty dark. I was just leaving a friend's house and I about struck a carcass. Carcass strikes are pretty common here, so what we do is call the troopers. Troopers come out and they'll remove the carcass. I was dialing up the troopers, and I saw a shadow come out of the woods. It was big, big for a bear, but it didn't match the shape of a bear. The snout was wolfish in shape. That's when it dropped down and disemboweled it. It grabbed the caribou and took off. It went for the woods, and it went for the woods quick. After it left, what'd you do? You know, I looked at what it left behind, and it left behind the entrails. Usually, when you see wolves and bears feed, as soon as they have it open, they go for organs. They go for the soft tissues first, yeah. yeah. Coming to this interview, my top three was this is just a bear. I was even willing to consider Ken's idea of a genetically mutated wolf. But this feeding behavior that Nick describes doesn't fit a bear or a wolf. 
The team is starting to feel that the natural explanations are becoming less likely, and the supernatural ones are getting harder to rule out. Alaska, a land of amazing scenery and a sinister secret. What happens to the thousands of people who go missing in the Alaska Triangle every year? Two hunters caught a glimpse of an enormous wolf-like beast just after their partner disappeared. Could native tales of the Amarok or demon wolf be true? Based on its reported size and isolationist nature, it seems unlikely to be an ordinary wolf, and its eating habits cast doubt on it being a mutated, oversized wolf either. But is it still possible it could be a bear? The team sets up a meeting with a big game hunter named Mike to cross-reference their evidence with his bear expertise. Hey guys, how's it going? Hey, how are you? I'm Mike. Yeah, yeah nice to meet you guys. Hey, Mike. Mike. So what can I do for you? It's a pleasure. We're here investigating accounts of a mysterious animal. It's kind of a wolf, kind of a bear. Behavior-wise, they claim that this animal is a, you know, it's a lone hunter, a solitary mm -hmm. hunter. It's nocturnal. Mm -hmm. And it according to legend, preys on human hunters that are foolish enough to kind of wander out into the woods at night. Oh, so okay. That, that's the legend. So it's a hybrid between bear and wolf? That's what they say. We've got features both wolf-like and bear-like. The possibility of a wolf-bear hybrid has already come true according to the fossil record. For more than 44 million years, the Amphicyonidae, also known as bear dogs, roamed North America, Eurasia, and Africa. They were some of the largest carnivores of their time, with certain varieties topping 1,300 pounds. But these monstrous predators went extinct two million years ago. Or did they? Bear dogs belonged to a suborder called Caniformia. The Caniformia animals branched into a variety of species, including bears, all canines, seals, walruses, raccoons, and badgers, to name a few. Could there be a hidden strain among these offspring, an ongoing crossbreed of wolf and bear that has remained undetected in modern biology? And could the open wilds of Alaska be the place it calls home? Well, I can tell you a little bit about bears. Let's yeah. start there. Pretty much brown bears and black bears are um, solitary animals for the most part. They prefer to hunt alone and to, to travel alone for most of the time. They don't just prey on the sick and wounded. That's kind of a common myth about bears. Um, they just get whatever they can get. Um, if it's in front of them and they can catch it, they'll go for it. They're a predator. If he comes out and you take off running, he's going to chase you. It's just in his nature to do it. Mike describes the aggressive behavior of bears, explaining that they will give chase just because they're wired that way. But so far with the demon wolf, the account suggests a more cautious approach, waiting until the prey is alone or attacking when there's sufficient cover. If this is just a bear, it's one with a high degree of cunning and intelligence. So we're planning to go out and look for this animal. I was wondering if you could give us any tips um, when we go back out there. If it's bear-like, should it even be active this time of year? Bears do occasionally come out of their dens during the winter. One thing that you can look for, a lot of times bears will get up against a tree and they'll bite that tree as high as they can reach or they'll claw it with their claws. And it's kind of a territorial thing. Down in southeast Alaska, we see a lot of that mm -hmm. sign there on the alder trees, a lot yep. of a real soft bark, and they'll get in there and chew mm -hmm. and claw that up. Another thing that you can look for, bears are fairly well known for burying their kills. Uh, it's sort of a way of saying, that's mine. Almost every time, they'll relocate that kill. They'll grab it and they'll drag it off about 40 or 50 yards out in the brush somewhere, and they'll bury it. So you've got to be really cautious when you go into these kill sites and make sure you're not running into a situation. And this could also be an explanation, possibly, for some reason why these people aren't discovered. Mm hmm When I think about how Ben Jones disappeared, maybe whatever got him picked him up whole and buried him somewhere. No drag marks, no pieces left behind. That would explain a lot. These are all helpful hints for us to maybe see if we can find what we're looking for mm -hmm. out there and sign of bear or animals maybe the Amarok is related to. Excellent. Really appreciate oh, getting to meet you guys. Good luck you. on your expedition, and I'll be looking. Mike's insights have given the team a plan. They'll revisit the location of Nick's roadside sighting and look for scratches on trees or patches of dug up earth to see if they can track this creature down, be it a bear, a prehistoric canid, or something else.
The team arrives at the site where a beast was seen snatching carrion from the roadside. This time, they brought some carrion of their own. Tommy, I appreciate you carrying that beaver out here, brother. The wolves are actually very fond of dead beavers, so I think that that could be a key piece of bait. We still don't know if we're dealing with a wolf or a bear or something that displays the characteristics of both. So we're keeping both in mind using the beaver as bait. We know that wolves eat them, and bears are opportunistic. They'll eat anything. So this should draw the creature out, whatever it is. Damn, this is thick. Has anybody seen any tracks or anything yet? Not yet. Hey, guys, check this out over here. It's a car mark on the tree. Oh. Well, that's something. Some serious claw marks there. It's just like a bear mark in his territory here. But look how widespread they are. What's really jumping out at me is just the freshness of the cuts, right? I mean, this isn't something that's been sitting around a while, so. This is a pretty big bear that would have done this. But usually, they're in this range, so this is pretty high. Definitely to stay alert tonight. I've seen bear scratch marks on trees my whole life, and even the biggest bear leave a fairly tight scratch pattern on the bark just a few inches wide. These marks are spread out over more than a foot. So it's either making these scratches one at a time, which I've never seen before, or this is one massive animal. The open wilds of Alaska are a paradise for predators. Bears and wolves thrive in this land of abundant prey. But could these rich feeding grounds have given rise to a new type of predator, described by witnesses as a cross between bear and wolf, that is making meals out of man? Among the recent epidemic of sightings, Healy resident Sean Decker had a frightening experience on a winter's night in 2008. Me and my girlfriend, we were spending the weekend over at my parents' vacation home over near the foothills. And before I went to bed, I decided to take out the trash. So I went out back, and then I had this mysterious feeling like something was watching me. And then I heard a noise over by the trash cans. And I saw what looked like a bear. But it had limbs like a dog or a wolf. And then when it looked up at me, I ran back inside. I'll never forget the look of its eyes when it stared back at me. As they explore the spot of a reported Amarok sighting, the team discovers some unusual scratch marks on a tree. This is a pretty big bear that would have done this. Usually they're in this range, so this is pretty high. Definitely need to stay alert tonight with some of the noises we're hearing. And let's see if we can find any more signs nearby. Hey guys, we got some bones here. Not far from where we find the scratch marks, we spot a pile of animal bones. And there's half a pelvis, big animal. They're all separated and picked clean with almost surgical precision. Get a full leg here and joint. It's not unexpected to find bones where predators roam, but the state of the remains may provide a clue. Looks like there's more than four legs. Am I wrong about that? Okay, we got a whole nother leg over here. Yeah, there's more than four legs. This has got to be more than one animal. I mean, we're looking at at least six legs here. This is not a normal kill site. Bears are known to stash food, but not usually in the same place. It appears something is treating this spot like a home base, something other than a typical bear. We're right in the middle of where someone brings in, hides their food. We need to definitely be alert. You almost imagine a predator bringing his prey here, lying right here while he's gnawing on his prey. What's missing? Skulls. Exactly, there's no skull. Typically, you find a ton of vertebrae, and those are some of the most common things you find because mammals have so many vertebrae. There's no rib cage there's here. There's no rib cage, there's no vertebrae, which would indicate that the, the meaty parts. Right. You know what this kind of reminds me of is Nick's story about what he saw grabbing meat off the road and diving off into the forest. Leaving pieces behind. Leaving pieces behind. I was still hanging on to the bear theory, thinking one strange incident on the roadside wasn't enough to rule it out. 
But now we see the second bizarre feeding ground that doesn't fit bear behavior. What kind of animal is strong enough to carry two, three, possibly 400 pounds of bone and muscle and flesh to a spot like this without dragging it in the forest? I know a grizzly bear can. They can pick up and carry a whole hind quarter away. But grizzlies are not hunting big game right now. They're hibernating. Wondering if this might be a good place to lead the beaver. What do you think, Jax? Yeah, I'm looking for a good spot. A nice lean tree, possibly. How about over here? Oh, for the snare? Yeah, it, overhanging tree is great. It appears the team is in the territory of whatever this creature is. They decide to set up a big game snare. If we can catch this thing, or even slow it down for a moment, then maybe we could photograph it and verify it. A good solid tree here. We should be able to hang the snare from here and tie off the tree over here. So here's the snare. Yeah, it should be plenty of height to hang it here. All right, perfect. Here you go, Jack. Can you put that up there? I have some uh, hemlock moss over here. We're going to camouflage it a bit. Setting up this trap is a bit unnerving. We could be at the epicenter of this animal's territory, and we're out here dangling food for it. We need to set this trap correctly, but then we need to get away from here. So we have our beaver enrichment. We've got some wolf urine. This is like an Amarok buffet now. Do you hear that? Deep in the Alaskan interior, a scourge is raging. People are going missing by the thousands. What makes this area so dangerous? Natives have long believed that an enormous demon wolf roams this wilderness. It is said to appear without warning and kill without mercy. Giant wolves and wolf bear hybrids are known to have existed through the fossil record. Could a surviving strain be haunting the Alaska Triangle? So we have our beaver enrichment. We've got some wolf urine. This is like an Amarok buffet now. Do you hear that? It's right there. Here. Yeah. Ooh. Let's go check it out. As we go check out the sound, I'm reminding myself that we're tracking a top predator out here. Maybe it's an Amarok, maybe it's not. But whatever it is, we need to remain hyper vigilant as to what's going on around us. Hey, hold up, Tommy. Yeah. I think since we know, definitely think something's in the area, we should get out the thermal imager and see what we have ahead of us. Jax uses a heat seeking scanner to see if any warm spots indicate the recent presence of a life form. This path in front of us looks pretty fresh. If you notice on the imager, see the light purples going straight ahead? Some, some heat source has gone through here. I think I see something up here, guys. Let's take a look at this, guys. We got an open hole right here. We have a den. It's not really a den, I don't not think. Not really. It doesn't go in there. About a foot. If this is a den, it belongs to a small animal but it could be a hole that a larger animal started digging to bury some food. Hey guys, we've got the beginning of a blood trail here. Yeah, there's a trail, no doubt about it. You think we interrupted something here? Yeah, it's possible. I see there. Hey guys, look at this. Whoa, oh, check this out. Stay alert, stay alert, this is fresh. This is very fresh, guys. We just walked up on something. You guys take a look. I'm going to keep watch. We come across this moose carcass that looks like it's just been killed. There's fresh blood on it, and we notice a hole nearby that something might have started digging to stash this prey. So whatever got this moose can't be far. This is definitely the time to have my firearm at the ready. This thing's been tore apart. There's pieces everywhere. This is rib cage over here. Hey, Jax, do you see or hear anything? Wait, quiet. 
No, I'm not hearing anything. Something got to this. So what do you think here? Um, bear, wolf? Personally, I think I think wolves have been all over this. The bear would have just carried the whole thing off and kind of buried it somewhere. You don't really see any evidence of uh, canines around, though. We really don't have very many tracks at all around here. I don't see any moose tracks, even. A kill this fresh should have prints in the surrounding snow, wolf, bear, or otherwise. Instead, there's not a clue to be found. This is pretty trippy, Tommy. Yeah, very unnatural. This moose kill, I don't know what to make of it. It's like it was magically dropped here by some mystical culprit. The quest to find out why so many people go missing in the Alaska Triangle has brought the team to an area of numerous demon wolf sightings. Could this massive wolf bear creature be attacking humans and making them disappear without a trace? The team has found a moose carcass with no tracks nearby and no discernible marks on the carcass from any predator. It just doesn't look like any animal kill, fresh or otherwise, that I've ever seen. This is pretty trippy, Tommy. Yeah. Very unnatural. You guys hear that? Yeah, that sounded like it came from where we were setting up our trap. Holy hey, cow. Hey, hey, what's going on here? Where's, Where's the, the beaver? beaver? Trap looks undisturbed. What do you think? No idea. Over here, Ken. You're not going to believe this. Our beaver's gone. The beaver's gone? No trace. I'm definitely not seeing any, uh, any animal tracks, but truth be told, we walked through here a couple of times. Honestly, guys, I'm not surprised the beaver's gone. I mean, come on, we're out here in the middle of Alaska in the winter, so it's a pretty <laughs> prized food source. Well, let's look at what we think is in the area. There's no sign of a bear paw here, for sure. No sign of wolf pack. Huh. Could and be a small, smaller animal that might have taken off with it. The trap is untouched. The snare is untainted. Legends of the Amarok talk about how it can appear or disappear instantly. Based on what we're finding at the snare, I can see how the stories came about. Something's obviously in the area. We got bones in an area that obviously something's feeding. We've got a moose that we just saw, and now our bait is gone. Doesn't leave us a lot of options here. Yeah, without more bait, we can't set another trap. And we didn't have the cameras up yet either. We missed our chance to film this thing. This creature is either very lucky or highly intelligent. Did it actually distract us away from our trap in order to steal our bait? Or is that just a coincidence? Either way, with no more bait to use and clearly a dangerous predator out there, we shouldn't stay here any longer. Let's head in. Whew. So we made it back to the truck, huh? Yeah, we did. Gentlemen, thoughts? I think uh, we did what we could. We've explored a number of possibilities during this investigation, trying to figure out what this creature is. It seems safe to rule out a normal wolf just based on the reports of its size alone. And a normal bear doesn't seem likely either because its feeding habits don't line up. You know, if this creature, the Amarok, is really out there, it's lived a long time without being discovered. I think if you put it all together, then there's definitely something to digest here. For a while, I favored the theory that this could be a mutated or perhaps exceptional animal, like a wolf displaying gigantism or something. But even if that explains its exceptional size and behavior, there's another problem. Animals with genetic mutations like this often suffer from health problems. They don't live as long, and many are sterile. They're incapable of reproducing. So how do you explain all these different sightings that have been going on for such a long time? At this point, I'm thinking it's either a surviving strain of some prehistoric species, which is a long shot, 
or else we're firmly in the realm of the supernatural. I'm dedicated my life to investigating the unexplained. And in a place like this, who knows? For now, the legend of the demon wolf remains just out of reach. But is that because this giant beast is a mere figment of frightened imaginations? Or could it be the kind of predator that only reveals itself fully to those it destroys? Modern canids rule the Alaskan frontier as proven, efficient hunters. But the fossil record suggests there could be something more. And in this vast expanse, there's room for a lone beast to hide and to thrive by making any who cross its path go missing in Alaska. In 2012, a hunter was trekking through the boreal forest north of Fairbanks, Alaska, searching for moose. As he crossed a ridge, something below drew his eye. He approached cautiously and found what appeared to be a ravaged campsite with an oddly constructed shelter. The hunter scanned the scattered supplies and then spotted the blood. He heard a cry from the trees and caught a glimpse of what he would later describe as a monkey-like beast he fled the scene and alerted authorities, but the missing camper was never found. Inside the vast frontier of Alaska is a mysterious triangle, where each year, five out of every thousand people go missing. Something out there. Three investigators look for answers. Jax, a former police officer. Ken, a specialist in strange phenomena. And Tommy, an expert on Alaskan legends. Together, they uncover mysterious sightings and ancient legends, exploring the possibilities of those who go Missing in Alaska. The team's investigation begins north of Fairbanks, heading to the site where the camper went missing. This habitat is remarkable. It's just teeming with life. This area is a rich environment with lots of water, plenty of trees, a perfect place for animals to thrive. Obviously, what I'm most interested in is this hunter's account of things moving through the trees and making primate-like sounds. That is really weird and interesting. There's never been a single confirmed sighting of a monkey in Alaska. Also, it's illegal to own a primate here, and the zoos don't even have them. So I'm skeptical of the hunter's claims about seeing a monkey. There's our water source, Ken. Yeah, animals are drawn to water, so this is a good place to see what may be living out here. What is that on the other side? Look at this. Those are feathers. Something definitely preys on something here. And whatever it was sat up here plucking this seagull and just, yeah, stripped it all down. Seagull feathers? Yeah. Right here in my hand, Ken. Shoulders and breastbone right there. Holy shit. Now, what kind of animal would pluck a bird? The bald eagles will catch a seagull right out of the air and land in a tree and, and pluck it and eat it. I've, I've seen that many times. And something with opposable thumbs. It would be unusual for a primate to eat something like a bird, but not impossible. Do you give the hunter's story any credit, Tommy? There's a legend story that's been around for centuries with the Athabascan people. 
like Katani. It's a tailed creature. Like a monkey? Like a monkey, maybe 30, 40 pounds, three, three and a half feet tall, living in trees and in caves on the ground. The Katani, literally translated as tailed ones, are described as moderate-sized primates with powerful legs and razor-sharp claws. These baboon-like beasts are said to be much smarter than normal monkeys, capable of sophisticated communication and coordinated attacks. The harsh environment of Alaska and the lack of fossils suggest monkeys have never lived here, but that doesn't mean they couldn't. Something like that would really have to adapt to its surroundings. And obviously, you have to weather the cold, but I mean, we know that the Japanese macaques, the snow macaques, they're very hardy. They can endure temperatures as low as 20 degrees below zero, live in high altitudes and live in the snow. So Pretty harsh. It's not that far a stretch for me to imagine that some type of primate might live in this environment. The Katani legend really interests me because if there really are no monkeys in Alaska, then what inspired the stories? Most Alaskan legends reflect real local animals. The Amarok is a cross between a wolf and a bear. The Kushtika is a hybrid of otter and man. So how did the Katani legend take root without real monkeys to inspire it? How stable do you think this is? Looks all right. Jax moves to a higher vantage point to scan the forest. But if monkeys are out there, Ken believes they won't be seen until they want to be seen. Monkeys are very smart. Uh, there have been studies that have been done in France on baboons, and they were able to get these baboons to memorize 10,000 different images. So we're talking about something that's highly intelligent. I don't know, guys. Witnesses are describing something like monkeys because they're afraid. And when there's fear involved or any kind of incident where your adrenaline's going up, things always get exaggerated. I know I need to keep an open mind, but right now, I'm just not buying this monkey business. I think we're probably dealing with a crime that's been committed by a person and not an animal. With several miles to go to reach the site where the camper went missing, the team gets back underway, knowing it will be dark soon. According to the GPS, this is it, guys. This must be the remains of the structure that the hunter was talking about. This seems way big for a one-man shelter. And you also notice that nothing's been cut, everything's been broken. Right, yeah, I'm seeing that too. Snapped off Snapped or there. Yep. rotten ends or nothing's clean cut. The first thing that I noticed about this structure, it was really crudely built. If he had a knife, then why didn't he use it? And if he didn't have one, then why is he settling into such a remote spot without the proper tools? Either way, we need to check the surrounding areas for any clues about what happened to him. I think we need to document what we got here. And then I think we need to split up. We'll cover more ground. Agreed. We need to get out there and see what's here. If this camper was attacked by the Katani, it is believed that they hunt in packs and can skeletonize their prey as fast as piranhas. Any group that large and active would almost definitely leave signs. You head out to the east, I'll head north, you go west? Yes. All right. Searching Alaska for killer monkeys might seem a bit far-fetched, but new monkey species are being discovered all the time and all around the world. Last year, in South America alone, five new species of sake monkeys were discovered. In 2012, the Lasula monkey was discovered in the Congo. And in 2010, a new species of snub-nosed monkey was found in Myanmar. Could Alaska, where animals grow to immense sizes, be the home of an unknown species of monkey that has grown large enough and aggressive enough to be a threat to humans. That's interesting. I come across a downed tree with roots that have been freshly gnawed. I don't know what kind of animal would have done this. Tom, are you there? Yeah, Jack. Hey, head over to my location. I'm about 1,000 yards northwest. I'm going to shine my light. Hopefully, you can see me. All right, I'm heading that way. All right, I got gotcha. you. Check this out. What do you got? I walked right by this. I actually saw it when I turned around. The roots have been gnawed. I know the bears are just not coming out of their dens. Usually, they're out there digging up tender roots or other grasses that are starting to grow. This is pretty soft ground yeah. around here. I don't see any 
sign a bear. There should be footprints if a bear came through here. Yeah. Whoa. What the heck? Jax or Tommy, can you hear me? Go for both of us. You guys need to come check this out. I found something interesting. I'm about a quarter of a mile east of you. All right, make sure you shine your light so we can see you. We'll be out of here in a few seconds. You got it. What you got? What you got? Check this out. Claw marks? That's what it looks like. Evidently, something gouged some very deep cuts in this particular tree. They're very high up the ground, and these cuts are very fresh. And while two of the marks are somewhat in line, one seems to be at an opposing angle. Tommy, is that a bear? Hard to say. Generally, bear scratch marks aren't at random angles. They, they're all together. Scratch marks on trees are a common way for bears to mark their territory. But these markings generally mimic a footprint or leave parallel lines. What the team has found doesn't fit the paradigm. Guys, I don't know what that could be. Maybe they're different marks from a couple of different animals. I think we need to go back and consult some experts in these fields. Let's definitely document it. And then I say, it's getting cold, and let's get out of here. We've come across a couple things tonight that are worth a second opinion. But as of right now, I can't explain what happened to the missing camper. Maybe someone else will see something in these clues that we don't. The possibility of monkeys in Alaska is no longer a question for fisherman Philip Hoyle who claims to have seen them firsthand back in 2007. I'll never forget, it was this beautiful, sunny afternoon, and I was out and I was fishing, and it was great. I caught my fair share of some fish that day, and I figured it was time to call it a day. As I'm starting to wrap my stuff up, I hear this ruffling going on in the trees. All I could see, these two red dots, they look like they could be eyes. I couldn't explain it, and I realized that these are some kind of an animal. The next thing you know, several more appear, and I can tell that they're getting closer. So I decided, you know what, it's a good idea to get the hell out of there. I ran back to my pickup truck, I locked the door, and as soon as I looked up, immediately this, this creature was standing in front of me. About four feet tall, furry, had like a dog-type face, and a simian ape-like body. I started my truck up, I revved the engine, and it, it must have scared the hell out of the, the creature, and it ran off. And I tell you, if I didn't run to my car when they came out of those woods, I'm certain that they would have had me for lunch, no doubt. The legend of the Katani, also known as the Tailed Ones, claims that they dwell in trees and in caves. The team found some irregular scratches on a tree near where the camper went missing. If there's a chance it could be one of these killer monkeys, Ken wants to find out more about them. He schedules a meeting with his friend Nick Redfern. Nick is a fellow investigator of strange creatures and has been in Alaska digging deep into local lore. Right now, I'm currently investigating a case of a creature known as the Katani. Yeah, mm-hmm. What yeah. do you know? sort of described by the Native Americans as looking like a monkey. Not an ape, but a monkey with a tail. Talk to me about behavior patterns. Where, okay. where could I find these things? Where do they live? They talk about these creatures chiefly living underground. We talk about tunnels, hmm. caverns, subterranean areas. We're also told they attack people, possibly even feed on people. Wow. These creatures are supposed to be highly developed mentally. Reports of them, for example, like setting traps to catch people. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What kind of makes it different to all other monkeys, though, is that he only has three toes. On my initial investigation, I actually found what appeared to be a three-toed claw mark on oh, the side of a tree. Huh. The thought of a three-toed monkey could explain the scratch marks the team found on the tree. Ken can't be sure that's what it was, but it opens the possibility that the Katani are real. Each year, new missing persons cases in the Alaska Triangle number in the thousands. Could the huge quantity of unsolved cases be related to native legends of strange beasts? And could one of these beasts, a three-toed species of killer monkey, be responsible for a missing camper, among others? Monkeys are not known to have ever lived in Alaska, but stories of tailed beings 
suggest it's possible. Ken joins Tommy to meet with physical anthropologist David Yesner at the local zoo. They want to ask him if such a creature, or any kind of monkey, could be alive here in Alaska. Hey, Ken. Hey, I'm Tommy. Hey, Tommy, good to meet you. As I told you on the phone, the reason we're out here is we're investigating the case of a missing hiker. And potentially, it could be linked to some type of unusual animal. All right, yeah. In a vast wilderness state like Alaska, isn't it possible that there could be some type of primate out here that maybe hasn't been documented yet? Well, it's always possible that you could encounter something that hasn't been documented. But what we have to base scientific evidence on, of course, is the fossil record. And Alaska is not the kind of environment that would support most of the primates that we're familiar with. What about uh, the Japanese uh, snow monkey, the macaque they have? Ah, there. good point. The Japanese macaques were quite closely related to some of the old world monkeys that are found in Africa. According to the fossil record, Early primates formed while South America and Africa were joined together. But once the continents split, the evolution into higher primates, including humans, occurred only on the African side. New World primates only migrated as far as the southern part of North America. Some Old World primates made it further north in Asia, including the hardy snow monkey. But only humans are believed to have crossed the Bering Land Bridge into Alaska. Can I show you some of these photographs? Sure, yeah. Just kind of get your By opinion means. on Now, this is the thing that I found that I thought was really bizarre. This is uh, obviously what I interpreted to be claw marks. Certainly what it looked like. Right? There's the measurements. We're looking at about four inches there. I know bears mark their territory, and usually going across, and you have four marks, but these marks are all in different directions, unlike a bear to me. Yeah. This kind of gives you an indication of like how high up the ground we're looking at there. Hard to say exactly what it might have been. Bears come to mind when you look at the claw marks, but you have to consider other possibilities right. too. Doctor, are you familiar with the legend of the Katani? I have heard that it's some kind of monkey-like or primate-like creature. Is that possible, a three-toed primate? Ah, well, now we're reaching back even further to even simpler primates. So if we look at the prosimians, who are the large group of primates that preceded the evolution of monkeys, you have ones that have claws on some fingers and toes with nails on others. Prosimians are a class of animal that still exists today, which includes lemurs and tarsiers. Like all primates except spider monkeys, which have four fingers on their hands, prosimians have five fingers and toes. But prosimians are unique in having two different types of claws. Some resemble human fingernails, while others are sharper grooming claws. These could leave marks on trees that make the animal appear to have fewer than five toes. How big would these creatures have been? For the most part, relatively small. There are some prosimians that are larger that are sort of cat-sized. I was looking for a viable alternative to this three-toed killer monkey theory and the prosimian claws sounded promising at first. But the small size of these animals doesn't mesh with the sightings. At this point, the Katani is still a possibility. As Ken and Tommy consider Dr. Yesner's information, Jax is on a mission to hear a first-hand account of a Katani attack. He meets with a local witness who claims to have had an encounter with these monkey-like animals just two weeks ago. Troy, how's it going? Hey, good. Jax, nice to meet you. Yeah, likewise. So is this where everything went down? This is uh, where I had my car parked, and this is the trailhead, yeah. So All right. the trail's over here, so if you want to follow me, it's quite a ways in the woods. All right, yeah, we can get down there, and then we can chat. The fact that this guy's sighting was so recent plays to our advantage. As a former police officer, I know that a witness's memory of an event gets altered as more time goes by. So this is about the area where it happened. So what happened? I was coming back from a long hike. I was heading back to my car. From behind me, I heard this screeching noise. As I turned to look, I saw some kind of creature leaping tree to tree. I just took off running. And then from my left, I saw it again. As I kept running, I heard the noise on my right, and I felt like I was being surrounded. But I was so far into the woods, I didn't know where I was. So I ran underneath one of them, hopefully heading towards my car. The fear of getting eaten, I didn't care. I just kept running. 
Can you describe what you saw, what this creature looked like? This is going to sound crazy, man, but it was monkey-like. Monkey-like. Yeah, the long, curly tail. Whatever these things are, it really scared him, and I take that seriously. Were you pretty close to the path you were being chased on? Yes. It's right up here, about another 30 yards. Well, if you're up for it, I want to keep heading that way. OK. How many think there were around you? Three or four. I feel like I was being surrounded. <sighs> hey, check this out. You were running straight towards this thing. I just saw one of these structures. This is much bigger and denser than the one we found the other night. That path that we just took. Look how this wall is blocking it. My friend, I think you were very close to being run right into a dead end. Jax has to consider a new possibility. Maybe the camper hadn't built a shelter. Maybe something else built a trap. I want you guys to see this. What you got? Here's the pictures. Right. Oh, wow. After Jax's meeting with a witness, the team considers a new theory. What if these stick structures are corrals where something is trapping prey, including humans? That yeah, definitely looks like the other one. Let's see how it's a lot bigger. Yeah, it's a lot bigger, a lot, a lot of work put into intricate. that. A lot fresher. I'm seeing a lot of greenery in there. Here's on the map, and here's the first corral, horseshoe, whatever we want to call it. Got it. And then over here is where Troy led me to today. Obviously, we don't know where these things are moving around during the day, but I think one thing's for sure. If they're not being seen very often, they must have some type of hiding place. Sure. Somewhere they're calling home. To my mind, I think that a cave would be the perfect answer to that question. What do you think about us starting here? I actually did talk to some local hunting guides, and they all mentioned that there were some caves in that area. I agree with you, this is the area we need to be searching, but I think we need to start our search at this new corral. Mm -hmm. It's fresh. It's obviously been recently set up. Maybe there are signs of food, animals, something being drug off, and a, a path, a pathway where these things may travel. And if not, I say we stake out the area and see if they come back. I've always heard that the tailed ones were supposed to be smart and that they had sophisticated communication and hunted as a team. But this kind of planning and attack puts their intelligence at a whole new level, and this is frightening. Primates attacking fellow primates is not unprecedented. Jane Goodall even noted a case of chimp cannibalism, where a mother-daughter pair was killing and eating other chimp infants. And humans are targets too, as the famous case in 2009 proved, when a pet chimp named Travis attacked a woman and severely injured her face. Could monkey-like primates now be targeting humans as food in the Alaska Triangle? Could this be part of why so many people go missing here? In order to best prepare for their stakeout, Tommy suggests a unique approach to their weaponry. We're gonna make some blowguns here and darts. Cool. Got some pipes, one for each of us. These are pretty long. Is this pretty standard? The longer, the, the, the more accurate you're gonna be. Oh, OK. Yeah, I mean, you can make a short one for short-range stuff, but we're, we're looking to get them up there. Tommy's idea to use blowguns allows the team to hunt silently. And with darts laced with tranquilizer, they could safely capture whatever is constructing these traps. For our darts, I cut up plastic, PVC. We're just going to make a cone with it and make it a little funnel. And then you can test it by dropping it in there. Fine fits. Perfect. People in the Amazon rainforest have been doing this for centuries, maybe thousands of years. So this is a proven method of hunting monkeys, no doubt about that. You know, if we had a gun, you fire one shot, you're scaring everything in the vicinity away. A blowgun is a weird weapon to me. But then again, this is all weird. If some sort of murderous monkey's going to come at me, I'm pretty sure my gun's going to come out. But for right now, I'll play along and see how it goes. These monkeys, if they exist, are probably lightning fast. So our aim is going to have to be dead on. <laughs> I doubt I'll have any accuracy at all if I actually have to use this blowgun. Fortunately, Tommy's done it before, so I'll follow his lead. I'll drop your dart in there. Hold it up and then and just launch it. Oh, that worked pretty good. What kind of range and velocity are we talking about with these things? These things can go up to 400 feet per second, up to 50 yards away. 
give it a go. Awesome. You got it, man. Good shot. Surprised the damage and the, and the depth it can get on it. Perfect. Excellent. Look at nice. that. I've hunted mysterious creatures all over the world. And the prospect of actually capturing a live specimen, that's the holy grail of my profession. Maybe we'll have a chance to do that tonight. Excellent. Look at nice. that. I think we got the hang of it. Let's collect the stuff and get out of here. Let's do it. Honestly, this blowgun seems like a cumbersome and inefficient weapon. But the guys are hell-bent on capturing whatever this is alive. So we'll see if it works. If the Katani creatures are real, a swift response is critical, according to Evan Monroe, who believes he and his brother were attacked by one back in 2010. It was the first week of August, so my brother and I went on our annual summer camping trip. It was the first of three nights at our favorite spot. While I was setting up sleeping bags, my brother, he just put out the fire, and he was going to the trees to dump the water from the pots and pans. All of a sudden, I heard him scream bloody murder. <laughs> This monkey-like creature jumped down onto his back from the trees. And as I ran over to help, he's whacking at the monkey with the pans. He must have clocked it pretty good, because the monkey bailed, took off into the woods. My brother, his shirt was ripped open, and I saw three nasty scratches right down his back. I'd rush him to the hospital. He ended up needing a bunch of stitches to seal up those wounds. Let's do this. So now we're making our bait for the Katani. The evidence and reports suggest that these beings may be targeting humans as food. We're going to set out an alternate meat that might tempt them and draw them in, pork. Well, if this doesn't work out, guys, I can be a butcher, right? This should drive them nuts. You guys ready to go? Yeah. We're always taught to be prepared when we go into the forest here in Alaska, so we're bringing our blowguns and plenty of darts. Personally, I don't know if we'll find a killer monkey or a regular monkey or something else entirely. But whatever's out there, I'm ready to solve this mystery. Alaska. The abundant wildlife here makes it a mecca for hunters. But is something hunting humans? Could a troop of killer monkeys be setting traps and picking people off, adding to the number of missing in the Alaska Triangle? Marks that the team found on a tree suggest a three-toed creature. The most famous three-toed tree dweller is the sloth, a sedentary animal in Central and South America. While not related to monkeys, it features many common traits in a phenomenon known as convergent evolution. Perhaps the plentiful, fast-moving prey of Alaska forced a similar animal to evolve speed and hunting skills. The team prepares for a stakeout, wielding blowguns that could help them validate the existence of these tailed ones. How far was this other trap? I think it's roughly a mile. Being in potential Katani territory at night is kind of frightening. Legends say that these creatures can jump up to 20 feet with lightning speed, but nighttime provides better cover for us. If we get our traps set and hunker down, hopefully we'll see them before they see us. This looks a whole lot different at night. Absolutely does. Very eerie, everything's steaming. It's really important that we remember what happened to the eyewitness as far as them coming up behind him. Yeah, so watch our backs, and I also suggest we stay silent. As much as possible. Let's keep moving. See, none of it was done with tools. It's all broken branches. They're all snapped off. The first time I saw one of these structures, I assumed a human built it. But some animals are skilled at construction, too. 
Birds build nests, beavers build dams. So I have to consider this primate theory as a possibility. All right, let's go set these up, man. Using the corral as their center point, the team will spread out three bait stations with cameras, covering multiple angles of approach. That's a good spot, guys. I'm gonna put the trail cam on here. Uh huh. Baiting with pork is a calculated risk. Pig meat has been most closely compared to human meat. And if these monkeys have developed a taste for humans, it might be habit forming. A famous case of this phenomenon occurred in Kenya in 1898. The lions of Tsavo were two lions that attacked and ate dozens of railroad workers and had to be hunted down and killed to end their rampage. Let's go back down that way. Yeah. The risk is, if the pork doesn't work, we're the real thing and we'll be sitting nearby. I think we're good, guys. Let's go get a higher vantage point. Jax uses a heat scanner to search for warm bodies hidden in the dark. Meanwhile, Ken fires up a call blaster to mimic animal sounds that might lure in their target. He starts with the Japanese macaque, or snow monkey, since its call might be similar to any local monkey-like beasts. To our left, about 30 feet up in the tree. What is it, a monkey? I see it, get the tranquilizers. <laughs> Where'd he go? Do you see it? To our left, about 30 feet up in the tree. What is it, a monkey? I see it, get the tranquilizers. Where'd he go? Do you see it? Let's go. Go, go. His branches broke off? Broken branches up here. Oh, hey guys, I found a dart over here. Is this a dart? How many we shoot? Just one from me. I shot two. That's three. With two of the three darts found, it's likely the third is in the brush somewhere. But if there's a chance they hit their target, the team needs to track it down. We might have injured it. Think about it. Where's an injured animal gonna go? It's gonna go home. Exactly. According to legend, the Katani's preferred home is well known. They talk about these creatures chiefly living underground, hmm. caverns, subterranean areas. We gotta go to the cave. Let's get moving. Okay. Just listen. Hear anything? No. What if it doesn't go back to the cave? Then we're on a goose chase big time. Tommy, what's this? Three toes? Does that look like the claw we had up on the tree the other day that Ken found? Ken. Ken. What's up? Does this look like what you saw up on the tree the other day? Yeah, I suppose that could be interpreted as a three-toed track. It is a track. No question about it. It's headed this direction. Before we take off, let's get a photo of this guy's. Tracks get messed up out here all the time. So you never know if it might be an eagle or something else that stepped there and its prints got compromised. If it's on the ground, it's probably wounded. We'd be real careful as we're approaching this, guys. Look, there's another footprint. We're definitely going in the right direction. It's coming down narrowing up here. Check the GPS. We're headed right towards that crevice in the rocks. All right, we may be stepping into the hornet's nest. So easy, man. This is kind of scary. 
Let's get moving. Come on. Go past me. This is the opening, guys. Look. I think I need to get in there. Are you sure, man? Yeah, we'll mount me up with the GoPro. You can monitor from out here. All right. You got a walkie, right? Yeah. Careful, buddy. Looking good down there, Jax. How's it going, man? I got something. What do you see, Jack? Some scat or feces. Possibly it has some berries in it. Maybe some fur, I can't tell. Yeah, it looks fresh. I'm gonna try to take a sample. I don't know what the scat sample will ultimately reveal, but it does prove that something alive has been in this cave, and somewhat recently. All right, guys, I got our sample. I'm gonna move further into the cave. Be careful, buddy. Oh, man, it's rancid in here. Oh. Guys, we got bones in here. It's rancid. Copy that. I'm seeing them. Those almost look human, man. You guys, I'm going to stop here and bag this up. I just package up the bones. Copy that. I don't know, man. I, I think you should pull out. I think we got enough. We've come this far, man. I'm keeping moving. me. <sighs> what is that? What is that? I can't tell exactly. It's a rib cage in a spinal section. This is fresh. Oh, that was back in the tree line there. It sounds like something's moving around up there. Jax, we're hearing something. You need to get out of there now. Coming out, guys. Roger that. Uh, whew. Uh, we got to move. Something's moving around up here in the canopy. The noise we heard, to me, sounded like more than one animal. I don't know if a troop of Katani was closing in, but whatever it was, they pulled back after we heard them. This way. I heard it right up here. It was right up here in these trees. Where? Right up here. You heard it too, right, Tommy? I heard a crash in. Yeah, there was something. It was like a crash, like a branch broke or something. You see any broken branches? I'm not seeing any. There's something out here. Where'd it go? Spread out, look around, guys. Holy cow, guys. Come over here. It's one of our darts. Don't touch it, don't touch it. You got an evidence bag? I do. I, I got some gloves in my pocket. Dude, are you sure that didn't fall out of one of our pockets? I don't know. Hopefully, we might have some DNA on it. This could be the smoking gun. There are only two possibilities for how this dart got out here. Either we dropped it ourselves, which seems unlikely since I don't think we walked through this area, or else it fell out of whatever animal we hit with our blowguns. This could be the break that we've been looking for. I mean, we got valuable evidence here. We could get lab work done, so let's get out of here. Let's head down the hill. The team submits their findings to a forensics lab for analysis. When the results are sent back, they reconvene to see if the evidence points toward the Katani or something else. I got the emails a little while ago. All right, man, stop with the suspense. We've been waiting. The scat. Apparently, it is very difficult to derive conclusive DNA results off of scat for a number of reasons. They're There's... just telling you what's in it, right? Exactly. It definitely looked like it was a predator. I mean, they found hair fibers and stuff like that. There's wolf in the area, and bears do trek through there occasionally. There are. So unfortunately, that was kind of a non-starter. So what did they say about the bones? Yeah, that's what I'm curious about. All right, well, it kind of confirmed our suspicion that it was a large animal, and in this case, a large known animal, which is a reindeer. Mm -hmm. I'm just glad they weren't human. I mean. Yeah, that was kind of scary there for a moment. We might have found our missing hiker there for a moment. Right. Yeah. So how did the bones get in the cave? That's the question. It could have been our killer monkeys, right? Something could have dragged it in there. Why not? 
could have been wolves, could have been a bear. I mean, anything could have dragged that in there. Now, as interesting as it is to speculate that these monkeys are real, we have to be careful not to jump to conclusions too quickly. I'm just not convinced that the evidence supports that yet. How about the dart? What you got? Um, the DNA test result on the dart come back as 99% human. Human? 99% human with a 1% variation that is unidentified. What does that mean, the 1%? Where do we go with that? It just opens up a whole nother can of worms because chimpanzees obviously possess 99% of the DNA code of a human. They're essentially our closest relatives. I think somehow we contaminated this, and this is our DNA. Contamination by humans is very common. Yeah, very common. And it's so simple for it to be contaminated. We handle them while launching them and retrieving them. Yeah. We can't rule it out. I mean, I'm with you. So here's the one that I'm having trouble wrapping my head around. Three-toed tracks. I mean, we know there are lots of three-toed mammals, sloths, different types of odd-toed ungulates. Some marsupials, you know, but nothing that we know of that's native Alaska that would have had three long claws and, you know, three digits that are that prominent. So right. based on our photographs, they weren't able to make any type of conclusive determination as to what those tracks belong no to. No theories at all, huh? Just completely inconclusive? Unfortunately, we weren't able to get anything there either. Let's suppose for a moment that we did hit something with that dart, but it didn't go down. It's like it was impervious to that tranquilizer. Could we be dealing with something that is somehow bioresistant to our tranquilizer? Some type of super ape, super monkey. There are people that believe that the government, the military, are engineering some type of super primate. You know, and Stalin was doing a very similar thing back in the 1920s. He actually had a program in the Soviet Union where he was trying to crossbreed humans and apes to create super soldiers. And we could be dealing with something here that was designed for combat that's bioresistant to things like tranquilizers. It's a stretch, but if the military is doing some kind of weird experimentation like that, why not here in Alaska where they have lots of space and privacy? The hunt will have to continue another day for what could be the most dangerous hunter in the Alaska Triangle, a creature that might be more human than we realize, that relies on strength in numbers and a killer conscience to make people go missing in Alaska. In 2004, two men were fishing in the Gulf of Alaska near Juneau. When one of them got a huge tug on his line, he stood to fight it, hoping to reel in a monster fish. But it might have been another kind of monster instead. His buddy continued angling for a catch of his own when he caught a glimpse of a green webbed hand and the fisherman was yanked overboard. The friend rushed to help and saw a tail disappear into the water. His description matched an Inuit legend of a vicious mermaid. Stories of similar creatures are known around the world, some more sinister than others. The missing man's body has never been found. Inside the vast frontier of Alaska is a mysterious triangle, where each year, five out of every thousand people go missing. Something out there. Three investigators look for answers. Jax, a former police officer. Ken, a specialist in strange phenomena. And Tommy, an expert on Alaskan legends. Together, they uncover mysterious sightings and ancient legends, exploring the possibilities of those who go 
missing in Alaska. The team heads into the Gulf of Alaska, northwest of Juneau, right on the southern edge of the Triangle, going to the spot where the fishermen disappeared. They're looking for any signs of unusual marine life that could explain the disappearances in this area. They've joined a fishing crew that had a bizarre find in this location just two days ago. A fish was pulled up in their net that appeared to have a bite taken out of it. That's crazy, man. It was unusual enough that they recorded a video of the catch and alerted the missing in Alaska team. Could it have a connection to the missing fishermen? The team will see if any potential culprits reveal themselves out here. One of the most famous mermaid sightings involved the famous British explorer Henry Hudson. Oh, wow. And in 1608, he actually logged that some of his crew members had a sighting of this mermaid. And he described it as, you know, basically a, a beautiful woman with pale skin and long, flowing black hair, and then from the waist down, the a tail of a porpoise. And so, you know, it just kind of makes you wonder when you're talking about a famous explorer like Henry Hudson. Mermaid legends date back to the time of the ancient Babylonians. One of their deities, named Oannes, was portrayed as a half-man, half-fish being who imparted wisdom to mankind. The Greek god Triton is one of the most famous mer-beings of lore, believed to control the ocean's waves. Even today, modern Hindus are known to worship mermaid goddesses. Could there be something to these legends? What makes them so prevalent across cultural lines? You know, the natives in the Arctic up north have legends about these, this Kuali Pollock. It's a mermaid-like creature, and it's said to have green skin. Parents tell stories to their children about staying away from the shoreline because these creatures will come up and snatch their, their babies away. The Kuala Pollock is an evil twist on the mermaid archetype. This aggressive creature is said to have long claws and vicious teeth for attacking prey. She sports human legs, but also a tail to help her steer through the water. And she wears a garment with a pouch used to carry away the children she kidnaps. She's believed to steal their youth in order to stay young herself. This story, this legend, is an Arctic story, though. We're in southeast Alaska. That's it's a long ways away. How far? Well, if you draw a straight line from here to there, it's 1,100 miles. But to get from there to here, it's not a straight line. You're looking down around the Aleutians and, and back up and down to the panhandle. Ken and Tommy are already doing the math on this mermaid theory. But so far, the facts aren't quite pointing there for me. Jeff, I got to ask. I'm all about the weird and the strange. So besides that wounded fish you found, what is the weirdest or strangest thing that you've ever caught out here? Um, that would be a wolf eel. You know what a wolf eel is? They're weird looking fish. It looks like a person, kind of, right? The wolf eel is a reclusive species native to the northern Pacific Ocean. Although not truly an eel, this creature can grow more than six feet long, but its most prominent feature is a face that looks more like an angry old man than a fish. Animals like the wolf eel make you wonder if they might have inspired these mermaid legends. If you caught a glimpse of that face over the side of your boat, it'd be easy to see how it could look half human, half fish. So Jeff, what do you think? What type of animals or predators out here would actually be capable of pulling a man under the water and, and holding it there. I think somebody got a line wrapped around their foot, tied off to a crab pot, and he's the bottom. He's no, my, my, my cousin was, was found in his bow line of his boat um, two years ago. Yeah. yeah, so you know what I'm talking yeah. about. I mean, you get hit, th those dungy pots, they're heavy. Even that little 50-foot lead line, that could hold me off long enough, and I'm done. I'm starting to realize how many hazards there are in these waters. Obviously, there's predators like sharks and sea lions. But there's a ton of fishing equipment and the very cold temperature of the water. There's a lot of ways to die out here. <clears throat> Some basic kelp. Could a clump of that be interpreted as a claw? Got the right color. When it dries, it dries black. Really? Maybe the guy that went overboard got wrapped up in a bunch of seaweed. And maybe that's why his friend couldn't find him. 
The team was hopeful that whatever caused the strange injury to the fish two days ago might still be active. But without any leads appearing, the next step will be to check out that fish for themselves. Mysterious attacks in the waters of the Gulf have seen a small spike in recent years. Randy and Sarah experienced one on Kodiak Island in 2006. It was really mild summer weather, and I just wanted to read my book and just kind of enjoy the weather. While she was camped out with her book, I went swimming in the water for a little bit. And that's when I felt something grab my ankle and pull me down. I heard him crying out, and I look over, and he's almost completely submerged in the surf. And then I catch this glimpse of something near him, and it was this green foot and a tail. So I run over to help him at this point, and I am completely freaking out. And I start to kind of tell him what I saw, thinking he would tell me that I was crazy. No, because I have no explanation for it either. The injured fish caught by the fishing crew was left with a local ichthyologist for examination. At this point, it's really the only clue we have. Ken and Jax receive word that he's completed his analysis. They head to the lab to find out what he's learned. Dr. Chris, come on in. Hey, there he hey. is. <laughs> How we doing? How we hey. doing? Well, it's kind of interesting here. Now, what you've got is a really nice species of the Kita salmon. But this salmon was, as you said, was net caught. Is that correct? Correct. correct. Okay. Yeah. You can see this crisscross pattern here. Mm, yeah. That's from the gill net. And then the fish is caught in the gill net. So this part of the body, it's, it's still trying to swim, and it's still alive at that point. When this injury hit, that was it. The fish was done. Is there a possibility that this animal could have injured itself somehow, maybe a boat propeller? Or... Well, a boat propeller is going to slice across. across here. So if something had an injury like this, and it was instantly dead, how did it end up in a little net? Well, it would have it would have sunk normally, but I think it got injured after it was in the net. So what kind of predator could make that kind of bite? The bite here has a curved feature to it, even with this ripping here. And it's about 14 centimeters by 7 centimeters deep, which is quite a large bite mark. When you look at the predators that we have in these waters, the orca, they would just take the whole fish. You might have gotten a head left. Uh, we look at something like the salmon shark. They would come in from the tail, and it would have been a very clean hit. This is a sea lion skull. Ah. This often hits salmon coming in. But I'll tell you, when they take something like this, they're going to shred it. Have you seen any kind of bite like this before? I can't say I have, no. It's almost human-like, just much, much bigger as far as how we would bite something. It's kind of interesting here. We've also got some really deep bruising on either side of the wound. And you can see that in here, and you can see the scale loss almost was being grasped. The ability to grasp and hold prey is limited to a few animals in this area, such as crabs like the king and tanner crab. But their claws would leave much smaller marks. Well, these are pretty big, <laughs> so I don't have an explanation for it. So far, this fish is the only tangible clue we have as to what could be hurting people in the waters of the Alaska Triangle. And it's not giving us many answers. Missing persons cases in the Alaska Triangle aren't limited to the rugged mountains and vast forests. A fisherman disappears in the ocean. A witness sees a green webbed hand. Other similar reports, some including a green tail, have many thinking of an Alaskan legend of a mermaid-like creature called Kuala Pollock, which they believe could be roaming Alaska Triangle waters. The team is looking for any clues that could explain the creature at the heart of these reports. It's kind of interesting here. We've also got some really deep bruising on either side of the wound, and you can see the scale loss. So are you saying that this fish looks like it was grasped by human hands? I wouldn't say that, but it's not impossible. Hmm. What other predator options do we have, then? Uh, I'm stumped. The ocean is obviously very vast and unexplored. Is it possible that we could be dealing with some type of invasive species here, maybe something that's not native to these Alaskan waters? All kinds of predators in our water. 
All kinds of new things being discovered in the ocean every day. Dr. Chris, this is some awesome information. I think it's definitely going to help us along in our investigation. Yes, sir. Gentlemen, I've been glad to help you. The possibility that an underwater predator could be part human has been hypothesized in the aquatic ape theory. This idea suggests that during evolution, primates went through a phase of living in water at least part-time. Proponents of this theory say vestiges of this era remain. The ability to walk upright enables monkeys and humans alike to explore deeper sections of water while still breathing. And if we do submerge, humans' relatively hairless bodies enable faster movement, and our dive reflex allows us to hold our breath twice as long while submerged as we can on land. With such innate adaptations to water, could a strain of humanoid creature have gone fully aquatic and be haunting the ocean today? Without a known animal on which to focus the investigation, Ken and Tommy decide to gather more intel on the Qualipollock legend to see if it might correlate with any non-local species that could explain these incidents. Hey, Aussie. Hey, Tommy. Good seeing you, my you friend. Too. Hi, Aussie. Yeah. I'm Ken. To what honor do we owe your presence here? But we're investigating a case of a missing fisherman. Very unusual circumstances. Uh, it's almost like something was dragging him straight down into the water. Almost a green-like skin webbed hand is what, what he described yeah. it as. OK. The Alupalik is an Inuit legend that uh, stems from northern Arctic to discourage children from wandering off by themselves or to the shore. The uh, Alupalik is a human-like creature. She has grayish-green-like color. And you know, their teeth are going inward. So that once they bite, will not let go. And her eyes being really dark, the child can be drawn into those eyes like that and then be snatched. It's very sinister. Wow, that's a very chilling description. But now, now this story is from the Arctic. Yes. Is it possible that the Kuala Pollock is migrating down to, from the Arctic down to here, southeast Alaska? It's probably due to lack of resources you know, some of the villagers are migrating to cities for economic reasons, and so there's less children to uh, go after. Predators follow the prey. Exactly. Yes. So has anyone ever seen this thing in modern times? Are there any sightings? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's been not just children, but also adults as well. Aussie, I really appreciate your time. You're very welcome. Always good seeing you, you my friend. Too. You too. Take care. We'll see you again. Almost all legends are based on some seed of fact even if the Kuala Pollock doesn't exist as described, could there be a living creature out there similar enough to keep the legend alive? A fisherman named Jameson Cantor says yes. On an outing in 2009, he experienced something bizarre. I was fishing off the coast of Yakutat, and I had just hooked a king salmon. I put my landing net in the water to try to catch it. And just about that time, I looked up and I saw this shape moving towards me. It was like it was a baby seal or a porpoise. But as it got closer, the proportions weren't right for a seal or a porpoise. Suddenly, it rammed my net. I struggled with it, trying to untangle it. But instead, it jerked the net away. Of all the weird things that have ever happened to me on the water, that was one of the strangest. The team reconvenes to discuss their findings. Even if sightings do suggest the Kuala Pollock, there's a problem. The legend places this mermaid thousands of miles away from these incidents. But Ken has a theory that could answer this dilemma. You know, one thing I've been thinking about, guys, is migration patterns. We're talking about a huge distance from here to northern Alaska, where the legends of the Kuala Pollock are relevant. Maybe thousands of miles if you were to literally go around the coast of Alaska. That sounds daunting, but I mean, when you, when you keep it in perspective, there are certain marine animals that migrate immense distances over the course of a year. One of the more well-known ocean travelers is the humpback whale. They can cover up to 5,000 miles annually from their tropical birthing grounds to their polar feeding grounds. 
Leatherback turtles can swim even farther, some going more than 7,000 miles on their annual Pacific Ocean round trip. And Pacific salmon traverse up to 900 miles, plus a 7,000-foot elevation change as they travel inland from the ocean as far as Idaho to spawn. Based on these facts, an animal swimming around Alaska is within reason. But what animal could it be? And why would it have made that journey? I put together a list of similar incidents reported to the authorities. I want to check and see if we can map out these sightings and see if we can see any correlations. Absolutely. A marine chart here. OK, Tommy. The first one's going to be in Juneau, May of 2004. And the second one's going to be on Kodiak Island. And that's going to be June of 2006. And our third and final case is going to be Yak Attack. And that's going to be July of 2009. A salmon fisherman said he saw a shadow in the water and appeared to take his net. Just got me thinking, what do these all have in common? Well, you mentioned the salmon fishermen. These dates on here are the peak of each region for their salmon migration. So you're saying whatever this thing is, it seems to be following salmon around the Gulf of Alaska. Possibility. Hmm. Huh. Tommy, when is the peak season for king salmon right here where we are? Right now. In southeast Alaska, king salmon maintain a strong presence from May to July with subtle variations each year. This year, July is the top month. Observing this pattern means that humans may not be the primary prey of this creature, as the mermaid legend suggests. Perhaps it's salmon, and that gives us an opportunity to track this animal down and find out what it is once and for all. Well, at least now we know what to use for bait. You guys think of what I'm thinking? I think we need some chum. Every year, thousands of people go missing in the Alaska Triangle. The disturbingly high number suggests there could be unrecognized phenomena at work. The team's search for answers has led them to the Gulf of Alaska, where a fisherman vanished at the hands of a mysterious creature. A wound found in a fish indicates a predator with sharp teeth that might have the ability to grasp its prey. Could it be a mermaid of North Alaskan lore called Kuala Pollock? The culprit appears to have a taste for salmon following the different migrations around the Gulf. The team is going to prep some salmon chum for another outing on the ocean, hoping it will draw the creature to them. All right, nice and bloody. Here we go. Well, I sure hope this works. Well, looking at all the locations and then what happened to us the other day with the fish in the net, it all points back to salmon. So I'll be at a loss if this doesn't at least get us another clue. We're going back out with the fishing crew today. We'll do an overnight trip to maximize our chances to find this creature. I doubt it's a mermaid, but it definitely could be a creature that hasn't been identified before. New ocean species are being discovered all the time. Just this century, animals like the ghost shrimp and flapjack octopus have been identified and cataloged. With less than 5% of the world's oceans explored, who knows what else could be out there? My theory is, you know, this predator has gone after humans on a couple of occasions. So I have a backup plan. While you guys were resting today, I went and gave a little bit of blood. And I thought we'll add some human blood in with the chum. Whoa, that's you, brother? That's me, donating to the cause. I've really got to hand it to Jax. I mean, bringing his own blood, that's a brilliant idea. It's been demonstrated that certain ocean predators, like sharks, for example, can detect scents as diluted as one part per 25 million. So if this creature really is drawn to people, a bag of Jax's finest should get its attention. With their bait ready, the team joins the fishing crew and heads back out toward open waters. All right. Everybody's on. The crew will help them put out nets with an eye towards catching whatever's eating salmon and leaving these unidentified bite marks. As the boat heads toward a location where there have been multiple reports of king salmon, 
the team keeps a sharp eye on the water. See him? Hey, there we go. Look at those bait balls. Oh, on the yeah. The depth finder. That looks good. Oh, yeah, look. One, two, three. Look, 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 look. See those bait balls? One, two, three. We need to set the net. We need to set the net. Heck, yeah. Get her done. With a swarm of salmon beneath them, the team feels this is the prime place to try to catch their quarry. This is the spot, guys. They're going to toss chump. Yeah, I'll do it. As the crew readies the net, the team starts chumming the waters, hoping to entice any predators to action. Perfect. Let me have that line. There we go. That's what we're looking for. That's perfect. Jeff, is there any chance that, you know, doing this chumming is going to bring in other predators, like maybe seals? No, oh, heck yeah. That's something we got to keep in mind, guys. That chum will bring all kinds of stuff into that bait. Hey, Jeff, if you don't mind, can you keep an eye on our line for us? And then, Tom, if you want to sure. hit the bow and keep an eye out there. Yeah, I'll take the bow. And then sure. Ken and I can be watching both shorelines here. Yeah. OK. With their traps set, the team settles in for some diligent surveillance. Got a lot of surface area to cover here. This is uh, kind oh, of yeah. daunting. Do you see something? I thought I saw something big. Uh, it wasn't just a white cap. Yeah, so I just saw it up. Yeah, south, yep. south by southwest over there? Yep, I do see it. Hey, Grant. Yeah. Go ahead and glass that corner. There's something in the water over there, seriously. Yep, yep. something just popped out right, right about. Right there. No, it's a black object that broke the surface twice. Just keep looking in that area right there. You see it? Uh, big clumps of seaweed. Is that what it is? The two seaweed? that I'm looking at, yeah. This is odd. The amount of chum that we're putting into the water should be drawing in all types of predators. Instead, we're not seeing any. I'm wondering if there could be some other animal in the water that's scaring all the others away. Wow. See that, Shelby? Oh. Big, huge thing in there. Huh. Whole bunch of stuff. Hey, guys. What's up? There's something pretty big on this uh, depth finder there. Go check it out, Ken. Oh, I see it, that shape right there in the middle? Yep. yep. Can you tell what that thing is? We're not talking about a school of fish here. That's, that's no, definitely that's a big, solid object. object. The Gulf of Alaska has become a popular destination for vacationers, fishermen, and adventurers. But has it also attracted a new kind of predator? Northern Alaskan mythology describes a killer mermaid known as Qualipollock, a humanoid sea creature notorious for kidnapping children and carrying them away in a pouch. Is there a real animal that could have inspired these legends? The manatee is credited as the most likely suspect to generate mermaid legends around the world. With five finger-like bones in their forelimbs and tail-like vertebrae, their skeleton could easily be interpreted as a mermaid. And their ability to do tail stands and hold themselves upright in the water makes live ones appear very human-like from a distance. The extinct relative of the manatee, known as the stellar sea cow, used to inhabit North Pacific waters, but these animals were herbivores. They would not have gone after people. The team is forced to search for another answer, and there's a chance they just found it. Wow. See that, Shelby? Oh. Big, huge thing in there. Huh. Whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> hey, guys. What's up? There's something pretty big on this uh, depth finder there. Go check it out, Ken. That's huge. Oh, I see it, that big yeah, yeah. shape right there in the middle. Yeah. Yep. Can you tell what that thing is? Wow, look at that. That's a humpback whale. Humpback whales, they come in here all the time. Observing the humpback was impressive, but disappointing in terms of our investigation. Obviously, this is not the animal behind the attacks on humans. The good news is we still have a long night ahead of us to continue our search. The mystery of this animal is of particular interest to Amir Gara, who was with a friend on a beach in 2007 when something tragic happened. 
I was out with my friend at Clam Gulch, which is on the Kenai Peninsula, and we were digging for razor clams. We were out there for about half hour when my buddy decides to head up the beach to see if he could find a better spot. It was kind of a foggy day, so it wasn't long before he was out of sight. But I was busy in my own area, so I wasn't really paying attention to him. Then suddenly, I hear him yell really loud. It was kind of freakish, because I couldn't see him, but it sounded horrifying. So I ran up the beach to see what's going on. And I can't see him anywhere. All I see is his bucket. My first thought was that he got too deep in the water and a riptide got a hold of him. But as I'm scanning the shoreline, I noticed these crazy prints in the sand. They looked humanoid, but larger. And the toes actually appeared webbed. I once heard about a mermaid legend in Alaska, and based on what I saw, I'm ready to believe it. As night falls, the team puts more chum in the water, hoping that their quarry will partake in some nocturnal feeding. I think that's enough. Sounds good for now, right? Don't you think, Tommy? All right, guys, it's going to be a very long night. I'm thinking we stagger some things here. I think if you take the bow first, I'll take the stern, you take a nap, and we'll just rotate. That way, we don't get too tired or complacent. There should always be two of us out here at one time, so yeah. Yeah, OK. Ken agrees to take the first sleep break, while Jax and Tommy man their lookout positions. They'll have spotlights ready in case they hear any sounds in the water. How's it looking? It's all quiet. Feels like the wind's picking back up. This is probably the toughest surveillance I've ever done. We're trying to find an unknown animal in the ocean at night. We've set up everything we can. Chum, spotlights, sonar. I'm even taking thermal imaging of the water to see if there's any warm bodies. But spotting this creature is going to be a tall order. Did you see that? What was that? Ken, bring the spotlight. What happened? Wild thud right here on the side of the boat. Might have got it with the camera. Did you see that? What was that? Ken, bring the spotlight. What happened? Wild thud right here on the side of the you boat. Heard a thud? You might have got it with the camera. Yeah, no. As soon as he turned over, it was, I put the camera down like that. Right Wait, so you heard something hit the boat? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Like a thud. It was kind of over here right. to the left, right there. So whatever it was, I saw something just like splash jump out of the water and almost hit the bottom of the boat right over there. Jax, did you see it? No, no, I just heard it. It was, I was so close. The, the noise just sounded like it was right next to us. Hold on, hold on, man. But you, you were rolling now, right? Yeah, I was rolling, and I saw something, like, wiped. So we can rewind it and see what you got? Yeah. You want to get it? You want to get out of the wind? Whatever it is. Yeah, no, let's, oh. let's see it, man. I want to see it. All right. Oh, here we go. Let's check it out. All right. Yeah, OK. I've been on these waters most of my life, and a bump like that is uh, oftentimes just a floating log. We call them a deadhead. We need to check the footage and see if that's all it is. Yes. You know what a deadhead is? They, they bob up and down. They bob up and down. And you, they, that's, I've, I've hit them before in my boat. Thud. I don't think that's what it was, but I can't say conclusively it wasn't. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, I was right there with the spotlight, and we didn't see it again. So whatever it was, it went back down. OK, and I'm going to stop it when it hits. Right? OK. Yeah. Hmm. Right there. Look, look at that right there. Right there. Huh. I mean, it's Be obviously great. something, but. Wow, that's weird. It's pretty dark. I can't tell. Is it a fin? Yeah, I think, yep. I mean, it, I it looks like it. It looks like a fin. But you can't really yeah. say conclusively, though. The shape on the video 
definitely looks like an aquatic creature, but there's so little of it visible and it's so dark that identifying it could be a real challenge. It looks like a fish to me of some sort. Obviously, it's smaller than a whale. So, I mean, I guess it could be something like a seal, but it just it just doesn't, no. It doesn't have the appearance The, the of fin's seal not all. right. I mean, Tommy's seen lots of seals. Is that lots like of a... seals, sea otters, they flip in the water when they, they, they're they up, and then they flip to go back down, especially the sea otters. It's not doing that, that's for sure. I mean, it's, it's frustrating because it's not definitive enough, but, I mean, we can't rule out the possibility that that is what we came here looking for. That could be the koala pollock. You know, the really weird thing is that we didn't get it on sonar, whatever it was, according to, to Jeff. I mean, but that, that should have shown up on sonar. That's a big footprint right there. The fact that this creature didn't show up on sonar means that it's probably swimming near the surface. So if we stay diligent and keep our spotlights ready, we may just have another opportunity to see it. I think we need to keep the watch going. Yeah, yeah, I'll take the next watch. Sounds good to me. All right. The team remains on alert the rest of the night, but they don't have any other sightings. The sun's come up now. Why don't we sink a camera down there? See if we can see any kind of damage against the hull. And who knows what we might see at this point. Sounds like a good idea. Cool. All right. Ready? Yeah. yeah. Whatever hit us last night hit us pretty hard. There should be evidence left at the point of impact. This is based on a rule of forensics called the Locard Exchange Principle. Dr. Edmund Locard was a French pioneer of early forensics. So well regarded, he became known as the Sherlock Holmes of France. He established the idea that whenever a suspect makes contact with any item, there is an exchange of material. This trace evidence can be used to identify the individual. In the case of a creature ramming a boat, there might be more than just trace evidence left behind. OK, going down. Ah, oh, man, that's a good picture. How's it look? Uh, good we, picture. Yeah, I don't see nothing yet. We, I think that's a good depth right there, Tommy. We just moved to the right. Go a little deeper right there. Hey, look at that. What is that? That's an obvious mark, man. I can't tell what it is. What the hell is that? You got to ask the captain. That Those might have already been there. What you got? What do you think? What is that? Those three marks, yeah. See that? Was that there before? No. You hit some debris before? There? Not like no. that. If we hit anything, that would be underneath. Wow, that's that's bizarre. What the hell is that? We got to ask the captain. That Those might have already been there. What you got? Those three marks. Was that there before? No. Wow, that's that's bizarre. And now look at it. It looks like a scrape. I mean, are we looking at some debris? Mark like that? Something get it from above and, and maybe possibly trying to pull itself up. To me, that looks like claw marks. I mean, we have to consider the real possibility that these are the marks of the Qualic Pollock. I think it's time to step up the game. I think we start chumming again, we use some of my blood. Let's do it. I'll get the blood. All right. Guys, we got to be careful, man. This thing could be dangerous. Tie that line off on the stern corner. We're good. Ready to start chumming? Let's do it. This is it. This is the last of our chum. Let's get it all out. We good? You guys ready for the blood? Let's see how this goes. Our last shot at this. We're definitely going to draw something in. It's all gone, guys. The blood trail spreads along the length of the line like an underwater dinner bell that should draw any predators toward the net. Hey, Jax, how about go up on top? Yeah, bird's eye view might work, huh? Right on, yeah. Perfect. You got that side, Tommy? Yeah. Hey, Tommy. Yeah? I can still see the blood out by the orange ball out there. Hey, guys, there's something in there. 
Feel the tension on it, Tommy. And it's heavy. Something's in the net. Oh, my God. Oh, Jax, get down here, brother. This thing is big. Holy wait. We got to get this thing in. Open the door there. Oh. oh. Got it? Uh, uh, uh. What do you guys got going on? We got something. We got something heavy in here. Watch your hands. Ow! Keep pulling it down. I don't know. We're almost at the end. There's nothing in it. Wait. There's nothing. Wait. There's nothing in it. Uh, it's gone, guys. No, something hit that. Hey, hey, right here. Whoa. Look at that. What the? Holy what? cow. That's what? huge. Look how big that hole is. You can fit two men through that. And that's frayed there. Sure is. What could do that? When then this large. I don't know, Grant. What do you think? A salmon shark? Holy it had to have been something. Uh, well, salmon Maybe. shark would have the teeth to do that. Something just eviscerated this entire net. This didn't get torn as we're pulling in. It's not. It's actually missing a section of net. It's like something cut it. Look. Yeah, when we that. started yanking that sucker in, it was really heavy. First few pulls, and then it just got light. That's crazy, man. That is absolutely crazy. I've never seen anything like this. Did you guys get anything on sonar? Were you marking? I didn't see anything. I didn't see anything on the on the. Look at the size of this. Look at the size of this. Big. Was it's right Crazy. in the middle, right? Holy moly. The team secures the evidence and gets back to their hunt. Yeah. But the rest of the day goes by without any more leads. As they make their long trek back to port, they consider the various evidence they found in this strange and mysterious case. Well, guys, this has been a pretty bizarre set of circumstances Extremely. if you think about it. I mean, you started off with the disappearance of the fishermen. You know, and the, and, the, and the account of a green webbed hand yeah. coming up on the side of a boat. And then we pull up a salmon. It's got a friggin' bite right out of the middle Not of it. Not just the bite, but the bruising and, you know, how it was grass. All the missing scales know, in there. And the, the hull gets hit. And what tops it all off is the net. The legend of the Kuala Pollock describes this kind of knapsack that this creature supposedly carries on its back and that it uses it to actually place small children that it's abducted. And at first I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe someone could misinterpret a bunch of seaweed kind of gathered around on its body. So now after this event with the net, who's to say that if this creature did exist, that maybe it used things like fishing nets, woven them together to form this garment. And that could basically explain that aspect of the Kuala Pollock legend. Well, I'm not far off from, from you with that. I mean, we're talking about 5% of the world's waters have been explored. So there's lots of creatures and they're constantly finding things. Man, a mermaid? Yeah. It's, that's a stretch for me. Yeah, but krakens and leviathans were considered to be legends for a couple thousand years. But in the 1800s, a giant squid was discovered, proving there's real bases to these legends. So who knows what could be down there? There are always things to be discovered. And, you know, admittedly, I am disappointed that we didn't get definitive proof of the Kuala Pollock. But if these things do exist and they're starting to make their homes in more populated areas, and in fact starting to prey on adult humans, then it's just a matter of time before they are proven to be real. Who's to say that something like that couldn't exist out there? For now, the mystery of what creature is behind these incidents remains unresolved. But there's no doubt there are far more life forms under the ocean's surface than we know. And worldwide legends suggest mermaids could be among them. Is it possible that climate change and the shifting ecosystem have driven a mermaid-like beast from Arctic waters in search of more plentiful prey? And could that prey include the missing fishermen, among others? If the legends are true, what was that? This vicious Kuala Pollock may be one more reason. What the? People continue to go missing in Alaska.